Welcome. In this video, you will hear some of the scariest holiday stories around. I am joined by many talented narrators, many of which I'm sure you've heard of. Mortis Media, Autumn Ivy, Darkness Prevails, Unit Number 522, Dr. Creepin, Raven Reads, Your Maker, The Dark Somnium, Southern Cannibal, Booze and Booze, Mr. Creepypasta, Nightmare Files, Let's Read, and a special reading of some Christmas horror poetry by Vidith22. Sit back, relax, pull your blankets up close and settle in. It's going to be a long, cozy, and terrifying night. Happy Holidays. Now, let's begin. If ever there was a time for hope, it was Christmas time. The pure, clean white snow covering every surface it reached, being crunched underfoot as people continued to mill around during the festive season, laughing and enjoying the bright lights lining the streets to enhance the Christmas spirit. One could almost feel the good energy and positivity radiating from the bustling street full of people. Perhaps it was the purity of the snow that made it feel as though miracles can happen. Not to mention the countless shows centered around unbelievable things happening during Christmas. The walls of Daniel's room mirrored the beauty he gazed out longingly to, but the room he was in was more of a prison than anything else. The blinding white walls did not have the splendor and beauty of the snow-lined surroundings. Instead, they seemed to represent the end. Cold, white emptiness. Hospitals, regardless of the time of year, are never nice and comfortable places to be. While not as comfortable or warm as his room back home, Daniel's family had done all they could to decorate the hospital room, and make him feel more at ease. As much as they didn't like to think of it, the reality was that this room would be the room that Daniel lived out the rest of his life in. Mitral valve disease had stolen the dream of growing up and living whatever life he could possibly have. The doctors had told his parents that they could possibly prolong what little life Daniel had left in the hope that he would receive a heart from being on the transfer list there were other candidates higher up on the list than Daniel, but the doctor had passed a comment that deaths increased dramatically during this time of year, and there was the ever-so-slight chance that enough people would die for his life to be saved. Hope goes hand-in-hand hand with faith, and Daniel's family prayed around the clock for him. His mother and father never left his side, and his relatives were in what seemed like a rotation regarding who visited him. There was never a moment that the room was not filled to its capacity, a dim murmur as everyone said their own prayers. The funny thing about prayer is that anyone can do it from anywhere in the world. While you say a prayer to bless your food, someone thousands of miles away could be praying for the exact same thing. Someone who shared a prayer at the same time was a gentleman by the name of Keith. Keith, too, sat praying for his life that same night that Daniel did. The difference in their situation was that Keith's actions were the cause of his soon-to-be death. Having been convicted of multiple counts of murder, his date with the gas chamber had arrived. He clutched his rosary and begged the Lord to spare him. His screams rang out in the halls of the penitentiary dim lights flickering and fellow inmates shouting obscenities. The room Keith was in bore absolutely no resemblance to the room Daniel was in. Midnight was the time set for Keith to pay for his sins. He could do nothing but watch the clock as the seconds brought him ever closer to death. Keith hoped that praying as much as humanly possible in his remaining time would prompt God or whatever higher being to save him 
from this situation. A shaded figure drifted past the guarded cell that housed Keith in his final hours, which Keith presumed to be the priest. The warden had advised Keith that a priest would attend to him prior to his execution to comfort him and pray for and with him. Save me, father. Keith shouted at the figure as it walked past his cell. It seemed the priest wasn't going to stop for him, so hopefully the priest heard him shout and will pray for him. Seemingly following the priest that walked past him, a guard opened the slot to his cell and pushed a tray with food in. Keith's Last Supper They had given him the freedom to choose the last thing he will ever eat, and to feel some sort of comfort through nostalgia. Keith opted for a dish his grandmother would often make for him. A medium-cooked steak topped with pineapple, and a side of chunky cut fries. It was a strange combination, but Keith loved it. Drifting in and out of consciousness, Daniel noticed a figure in the corner of his room. His room was quiet and seemingly devoid of the usual crowd that stayed with the poor child to bring warmth and comfort. Feeling the rosary his mother stayed armed with pressed against his hands as she clasped them, Daniel could make out the shadow a little better. There was what seemed like a distinguished light surrounding the head of the figure. The light, for some reason, cast no illumination on its face. It was almost as if the lights did not shine, yet somehow it did. With a fever boiling him, Daniel was consumed by his vision. He could feel energy radiating from where the figure stood, and this gave him what felt like an immediate boost in energy. Ask God to help me, please. I don't want to die. Daniel implored the figure in the shadows. What's wrong, love? Daniel's mother asked when she heard him speak out. There's an angel in the corner. It came to visit me, Daniel explained. I asked it to ask God to help me. Everything will be okay, Mom, he finished. Before his mother could reply, Daniel fell back asleep. Wondering what he was talking about, his mother turned around to see who he could have possibly been talking about. With the family having taken a break from the room to eat and clean themselves, the room was empty apart from Daniel and his mother. She figured he must have had a fever dream. Getting up to straighten the crucifix hanging on the wall that seemed to have been knocked by one of the relatives and now hung upside down, his mother's prayers once again commenced. When Keith once again opened his eyes, the first thing he did was look to the corner for his perceived guardian angel. To his disappointment, the only thing in that corner of the room was a table and the wall ornament made to remind us that Jesus died for our sins. No angels in sight. As the family began to pour back into the room to resume their vigil, the doctor walked hurriedly in and asked to speak to Daniel's parents. Fearing the worst, they trudged out of the room and stood with their doctor in the blindingly bright hallway. I've got some great news, the doctor began, all the while checking his watch. What? What is it, doctor? Daniel's mother asked with hope. We may have found a donor, the doctor said with the biggest smile on his face. The grief-stricken parents couldn't form a word to express their thoughts. The doctor gave them a minute as they sobbed and cried from joy after feeling so hopeless. It could not work out, unfortunately, the doctor said. Our primary fear is that Daniel's body will reject the heart. There is also the issue as to where the heart came from. Daniel's dad replied before the doctor even finished the sentence. Why would we care where it came from as long as it will save our boy? I feel obligated to tell you who the donor will be. You can then discuss it and let me know what you think. It's nearly 11. The heart will be available after midnight. 
Why on earth do we need to wait until midnight? Why can't we begin the procedure now? Asked the worried mother. You see, that's the thing. The doctor began nervously. The donation would be coming from a convict at the state penitentiary. He is awaiting his sentence, which is scheduled for midnight. Following that, the organs that are to be donated will be extracted, and the process for distribution will be done. Who it's from doesn't matter in the slightest. Some good will finally come from someone who has obviously committed heinous acts, stated the now hopeful father. As long as you're sure, the doctor replied. I will update you as I hear more. Keith was almost at complete peace by the time the official strapped him down to receive the life-ending cocktail. The curtains were drawn so the gallery could look in and Keith could look out. A voice boomed from the speaker in the room. Do you have any last words? It asked Keith. Keith looked into the audience and felt the tears begin to flow. As he began to formulate his final words, he noticed a figure near the back of the room, almost completely obscured by shadows. Please save me, Keith said with his last breath. With a new lease on life, opening gifts on Christmas Day seemed almost irrelevant because the heart he received was indeed a Christmas miracle. Toys paled in comparison to a life-saving donation. Ripping off the wrapping paper to expose the various toy cars and video games, the smile on Daniel's face warmed his parents' hearts. He was still in the hospital recovering, but the promise of living a longer and fuller life made the stint of recovery that much easier. He could grow up and do anything he wanted. The imminent threat of his heart being unable to supply his body with oxygen was no longer a worry. The nurses were overjoyed with Daniel's recovery, and the staff on all the floors of the hospital knew him, as he would often go on accompanied walks or wheelchair rides to get out of the confinement of his room. Picking up one of the toy lightsabers, Daniel begged to venture the halls and fight the enemies, quote-unquote. Being three weeks post-operation, Daniel was by no means completely able-bodied, but he could sort of hobble on his own at a very slow pace. His parents cast a slightly worried glance at each other, but ultimately nodded in approval and requested that Daniel did not venture far. His current nurse aide donned him with a panic button hung on a lanyard. If anything was wrong, Daniel knew to press the button and help would be attending to him in an instant. He was in a hospital after all. The elevator bell rung out as Daniel reached the floor above his. He exited the empty elevator and walked slowly down the hallway, occasionally swinging his lightsaber to activate the light inside. The hospital seemed eerily empty, but perhaps people were holed up in their rooms with loved ones, visiting on this very special day. The gleaming white walls now seemed to be the promise for the outside world. Daniel would get to enjoy snow, have snowball fights, and build angels. As Daniel wandered around the upper level, he noticed movement out of the corner of his eye. He turned slowly to see who could be roaming the empty hallways with him. He missed the figure as it rounded the corner, but he saw enough of a dim light at head level to recognize the figure that had appeared to him. Daniel hobbled as fast as he could, discarding the lightsaber so he could move as efficiently as possible. Making his way around the corner, he saw the figure disappear into a room not far from where he stood. Daniel found himself walking toward the room, but with no conscious thought to do it. It was almost as if he was being drawn towards it, much like a magnet would draw a metal. Standing at the entrance to the room, the death rattle signifying a breath being drawn was emitted from the bed. What looked like a skeleton lay in the bed, the hospital garments hanging loosely off the bones. The grotesque body immediately made Daniel feel uneasy, 
and he wanted nothing more than to go back to the safety and comfort of his parents. Before he could take a step, the familiar glow caught Daniel's attention. Standing in the corner of the room was the owner of the halo-looking light, shrouded in shadows. Ignoring the tortured breathing from the living corpse, Daniel took a step into the room, being drawn in by the figure. He did not remember moving, but once again his feet had a mind of their own. Stepping into the shadows, Daniel could feel the immense presence of the figure. It opened its mouth to speak, the pungent aroma of death and fear filling the room. You asked me to save you. I played my part. It croaked to Daniel. Now you must play your part. It continued. I... I don't understand. Daniel stammered with fear. God is good. I will be a good boy and go to church. Is that what you want? Be careful when you fall into the darkness. You never know what will answer you, my child. The figure whispered to Daniel. Now, Daniel felt the tears stream down his cheek, unsure of what to do. He closed his eyes to try and stop the tears. He opened his eyes and the figure was gone. Daniel stood at a bedside, but he was not sure whose bed it was or how he had walked to it unaware. He heard the rattle of the breath once more and felt a chill pass over him. The rattle breath was not heard again, and Daniel looked up towards the person in the bed. His gaze was met by the most vibrant red sheets he had ever seen. The once all-white room now had a deep crimson centerpiece on the bed. The skeleton man had been shredded to the bone, with said bone and sinew full-on display. Blood pooled around the neck and abdomen of the victim, throat slit and blood bubbling. There was no rattle, just the gasps for breath being restricted by the blood filling his lungs. Daniel stepped back in shock, almost slipping in the pool of blood accumulating at his feet. Distraught, Daniel raised his hand to press his panic button almost impaling himself in the process, a bloodied scalpel clutched firmly in his hand. Mind racing and feeling dizzy, Daniel burst into tears. He was not scared or fearful. He just felt as if he wasn't himself. Daniel knew he would just have to wash his hands and get away from here. No one would believe a little boy who received a heart transplant would be capable of committing crime, let alone the same crime as his donor. Well, would they even consider the fact that the young boy received a killer's heart? The blood and dead man before him didn't disturb Daniel after the thought of not being himself passed over him. He just felt a bit hungry after murdering the man. Daniel would go and ask his parents to get him some food now. He was in the mood for... steak... with pineapple... and fries. One thing the Hallmark movies and joyful Christmas movies don't show is that there aren't any Christmas miracles. There are only deals made, and the entities that conduct deals always find a way to have the last laugh. Be careful who you call out into the dark in desperation. Whatever answers you won't have your best interest in mind.
I love visiting my grandma. She always makes the food that I like, and in large quantities, and spoils me. With the hustle and bustle of college life, it's nice to go back to my childhood and allow myself to be spoiled for a few hours every few weeks. And even though she has six grandchildren, she made it clear that I'm her absolute favorite. She'd often have the whole family around for dinner, and after they left, she'd bring out the good stuff she made just for me. We usually have a big Christmas dinner together with the whole family. However, as the years go by and the younger ones start growing up, fewer and fewer people show up. Last year, everybody already made plans, forgetting about poor Grandma. I don't blame them, but I often forget how these visits mean a lot to her, especially ever since Grandpa died. That's why when I talked on the phone with her and she asked me if I had plans, I lied to her and told her I didn't. Oh, she immediately jumped at the opportunity to politely invite me, going so far as to offer me to sleep over at her place. She said there's one room which hasn't been used in years and I could stay in there. I immediately said yes and agreed to stay over, realizing how happy that would make her. I cancelled the plans I made with my friends, telling them something else came up. Although they were bummed about it a little, their drinking party wouldn't stop because of me. It was the last Christmas that I would ever spend with my grandma. On Christmas Eve, I arrived at my grandma's place and she greeted me like she always does, with a tight hug and lots of kisses. I barely even stepped inside when she started offering me food. She had already made what could only be described as an all-you-can-eat buffet. We dug in, and once we were done, she showed me where I could sleep for the night. It was a cozy little bedroom, which apparently used to be my mum's room when she was little. Grandma told me not to leave my room during Christmas night in order to avoid disrupting Santa in his work. She said that if I really needed to use the bathroom, well, I could, but to be extremely quiet and not to go downstairs. On the nightstand, she left a list of things I should do before I go to bed to ensure I got a good present. I decided to play along and abide by the rules. I told her I'd read it before bed and do everything necessary, and she seemed content with that. She wished me good night and left the room. I was pretty tired from the trip there and the enormous dinner I'd eaten, so I laid down on my bed and involuntarily fell asleep within minutes. I awoke a few hours later. I glanced at my watch and realized it was 3.01 a.m. I got up to grab a glass of water downstairs from the kitchen and groggily walked through the dark. I wanted to avoid any loud noise or turning on the lights and not to wake Grandma. I went downstairs and turned on the kitchen light, gulping down a glass of water. I glanced towards the living room with the Christmas tree and something caught my attention under the glow of the decoration lights. There was a small plate the tiny paper that said, For Santa. I reckoned it was cookies and milk, but when I got closer I realized that the plate was empty. Red liquid was in it, and right next to the plate was a small bucket. Obviously, I found this weird, but figured that Grandma may have just forgotten to put it away or something. I turned off the kitchen lights and returned to my room, just then remembering the list my Grandma gave me. I grabbed it off my nightstand and started reading. Dear James, thank you for visiting me for Christmas. You made your grandma really happy. Now, Christmas is a little different in this house than what you're probably used to, so it's very important that you follow these rules on the list. 1. Make sure to close your windows and ensure they are closed properly. These old windows don't work properly sometimes, so if you feel like cold air is coming in, let me know. 2. Don't put any wood in the fireplace after 9pm. Santa will be really angry if it's scalding in the chimney or if there's still smoke. 3. You didn't forget about milk and cookies, did you? Well, I stopped reading and chuckled at the list. Grandma clearly wanted me to follow the basic rules for Santa like I was a kid. But again, I decided to oblige. I continued reading the list. In this household, we don't use milk and cookies. We use raw meat and blood. I already left a bucket by the Christmas tree and there's a raw piece of chicken I put on the plate. Santa sure loves his diet. 4. If you're woken up by the sound of scratching and knocking on your window, ignore it. Your room's on the second floor, there's no way to reach up to it. In fact, it's a 
best not to look there. But if you see someone beckoning you, pretend they're not there. They may try to open the window from the outside. This is why it's so important to keep the windows closed. 5. You may hear growling coming from the kitchen. It's okay, because Santa never comes upstairs, and since I already left the chicken for him, that should satisfy him. Oh, by this point, I was sure Grandma was just messing with me. That was until I heard the sound of three gentle knocks on the window behind me. I froze in place, staring at the list, but practically staring through it. Three more gentle knocks ensued, but I did my best not to give away that I'd heard them. Once again, there were three more knocks, and then the sound of scratching started. First gently, and then louder, as if a rat was trying to bite through the wall. It lasted for around a minute until it completely stopped. Only when it did did I gather enough courage to slightly shift my position. That was a mistake, though, because when I looked down to the floor, at the light which was cast in from the window, I saw the unmistakable shadow in the form of a humanoid silhouette stretched across. I couldn't tell for sure, but it looked like whoever was there held both his hands on the window and stared directly towards me. I decided the best thing to do was continue reading the list to try and distract myself. 6. Someone walks into your room while you're sleeping and you happen to wake up. Pretend that you're still asleep. In the worst case scenario, the person will sit on the edge of your bed and observe you, so do your best not to let them know you're awake. If you feel their breath on your neck and it gets progressively closer, it means they realized you're awake. 7. You may hear me calling you from downstairs. Don't listen to it. I will under no circumstances go downstairs during the night. 8. Last and most important rule. If you get up to go to the bathroom, never, ever, ever turn on any lights in the house. He has trouble noticing you in the dark. But if you turn on the lights, he'll be able to follow you wherever you go. And then not even locking your door will help. Follow these simple rules and in the morning, we can open your Christmas presents. Love, Grandma. The scratching and knocking had already stopped by the time I was done reading, and the shadow from the window was gone. I got into bed and covered myself over my head, shivering, oh, and not from the cold. Sometime during the night, I heard my door open, but did my best to ignore the footsteps and low growling noise. I either passed out or fell asleep sometime later. But all I know is I woke up to the sound coming downstairs from the kitchen. I shot up, looking around the room at the window, rubbing my temples and thinking about the nightmare I'd had. I left my room and immediately heard my grandma's voice calling me from downstairs to come and open the present. I told her I was coming when I suddenly felt a grip on my wrist. I turned around and saw my grandmother staring at me wide-eyed. She leaned in and whispered in my ear, with a trembling voice, You turned on the lights, didn't you? A few years ago, I went to visit an old friend for Christmas. Happenstance had it that we were both alone around the holidays, so instead of spending it alone like a couple of old spinsters, we decided to have a very drunk Christmas, just the two of us. So after a Christmas dinner of fried chicken and waffles, and a lot of wine, we both hit the hay with plans to nurse our hangovers all day the next day. Being the good friend that she was, she let me take her big double bed while she took the smaller, lumpier single one in her spare bedroom. Then, in the middle of the night, I found myself waking up with a distinct feeling that there was someone in the room with me. I don't know if I'd heard the door creak or a footstep on the carpet, but I rolled over in bed, then sat up to look at the door. I was expecting to see my friend, and although I only caught a glimpse of the face in the doorway thanks to how dark it was, I saw enough to know that it definitely wasn't my friend. Out of pure instinct, I cried out something like, 
who are you? I was startled but not frightened, and I assumed that it was all just some kind of innocent mistake that some male stranger was just lurking there in the dark hallway. But that was all just wishful thinking, I guess. And as the man burst into the room and attempted to restrain me, I began to scream. But then suddenly, as the man was pulling me out of bed and forcing me to the ground, he seemed to experience this sudden realization. He'd obviously assumed that since I was sleeping in my friend's bed, that I was her. And when the penny dropped, he started demanding to know where she was. I was in no fit to answer him though. All I did was scream and cry and beg him not to hurt me. And the next thing I remember was the room's light flicking on. I opened my eyes to see my friend standing in the doorway, gun in her hand, and she's pointing it at the stranger while screaming, Get off of her, Todd! Get off of her now! A thousand different thoughts go rushing through my head, and I guess it was just more wishful thinking, but I figured if my friend actually knew this guy, then things would be okay. I know how dumb that sounds in retrospect, but I was exhausted, still kind of drunk and more terrified than I'd ever been in my whole life. All I wanted was for this living nightmare to end, but the reality was, we had quite a way to go first. The creep, his name was apparently Todd, started telling my friend that she didn't have the guts to shoot him, but she just kept saying, try me. Todd then told my friend that if she didn't put the gun down, he'd hurt me which caused my friend to start screaming, don't you dare. And the whole time I was just frozen with fear. I'd never experienced anything so terrifying in my life. I couldn't see any way out of the situation that didn't get me hurt or killed in some way, either by Todd's hand or my friend's straight bullets. I begged them both to resolve the situation, more blubbers and begs than anything coherent, at least up until Todd clamped a hand over my mouth and repeated his accusation. It was obvious that the pair had some kind of history, and that's what gave me the most hope that things would end peacefully. But then, almost out of nowhere, Todd let go of me, jumped up to his feet, and brushed my friend. I heard two deafening shots, and at first, I thought my friend had totally missed because Todd just fell into her and took her down in the hallway. It was only when she easily struggled out from under him and he started to groan that I realized she'd actually hit him. My ears were still ringing, and I was still frozen with fear at that point. It was all just too much for me. But when my friend barked at me to get up and follow her, I did just that, adrenaline and all. I had stepped over Todd's body to do so, and I thought that he was going to reach up and grab my ankle like it was some dumb horror movie or something, but that didn't happen. He just laid there groaning, begging us to call 911. My friend did so, but her priority was telling the cops that she was about to kill a man if he got up and started attacking her again. The EMTs showing up in a timely fashion was just pure luck on Todd's part, and he ended up surviving his injuries, and my friend avoided both criminal and civil cases in the year or so that followed, but the story of how he came to be there, bleeding on her bedroom floor, is a long and convoluted one, and I'll try to keep it as condensed as possible, but here it goes. My friend was a divorcee, and around 18 months before that Christmas night, she'd met this charming bachelor named Todd. Obviously, she didn't realize what a monster he was at the time, but as the months went on, their relationship got worse and worse. My friend says it was like a frog in a pot of boiling water. Dropping it at boiling point, the frog tries to jump right back out, but lower the frog in when the water is tepid, then heat it up real slow so it barely notices, and by the time it's at boiling point, it's too late to do anything about it. The whole reason she was alone that Christmas was because she'd split up with Todd and was trying to move on. But Todd wasn't willing to, and the prospect of spending Christmas without the woman he'd once controlled was obviously too much for him. And that's how he ended up breaking in during the middle of the night, and by some miracle, it was me in her bed instead of her. Sure. What happened sucked really, really hard, and I wish it never had to happen, but like I said, it was kind of a Christmas miracle that I'd been there that night. If Todd had the chance to get the drop on her like that, if she hadn't been able to get to her gun, God knows what kind of awful things would have happened that night. I guess that makes me sound like bait in a way, as that's basically what I was that night, 
but she had no way of knowing he'd actually try and hurt her like that. He was a psycho, and an aggressive one at that, but I guess sometimes you don't know if someone has the capacity to kill or not until it's far too late to do anything about it. Both of our situations have improved dramatically, but we still talk about it every day. And at some point in the future, we plan to hold a joint Christmas together with all of our families in tow. Things are looking much brighter, but we'll never forget the night when, by some miracle of happenstance, we ended up saving each other's lives. I'm living very rural, in a small village with maybe 10 to 15 houses, but close to the highway. You can drive there within maybe 5 minutes, and also about 10 minutes away from the town. If you cross the street, it just takes you about 10 minutes walk to reach the forest. First Christmas Day. In the afternoon, my partner and I decided to go for a little digestive walk, as we were really stuffed from all the food. It was about 1700 hours, and already dark when we left. We had a big and bright LED flashlight with us. I also took my camera and my flash. I loved taking pictures of nature at night. We decided to walk on a little country road towards the forest and then turn right, following a small graveled cycle track close to the forest border, which connects our village and the next. About 15 to 20 minutes walk between the villages. In the middle part of the track, you have to walk through a small bit of forest. It's rather dark and the trees are very high and quite dense. When we entered, I saw our flashlight reflecting on something and recognized a car being parked there on the side of the track, close to the trees. And this struck me as odd, as cars are not allowed to drive there and the path is very narrow and hidden, so I was a bit cautious. My partner pointed the light inside of the car and it seemed to be empty. I also noticed the windows were frozen, so it must have been parked there for quite a while. A bit in front of the car, I spotted a tree with an intriguing structure, and I asked my partner to point the flashlight towards it so I could focus better and photograph it with my flash. After I took a few images, my partner said, Um, there's someone standing behind us in the middle of the road. He's looking at us. Nobody was following us the whole way. I kept looking around and behind us occasionally because at this time in the evening and close to the border of the forest, there's boars sometimes and it's mating season, so, you know, they're more aggressive than usual. But, indeed, there was a man standing behind us, staying just out of the flashlight's reach. He wasn't saying anything, just standing there and facing us. At first, I thought he might be startled, as it, you know, may seem a bit weird if somebody's just taking photos around your car. I mean, it wasn't even legal to drive on the path with the car, but, you know... I decided to get up and confront him from a distance, explaining to him that I was just taking the photos of the tree. He didn't react, and still just stood there. I went on to ask him if he needed some light, and he replied that this wasn't necessary. It was odd, but I was still calm, sure, about there being a normal explanation for his behavior. Nonetheless, my partner and I decided to just get out and followed the path leading to the next village. That was about five to seven minutes until we reached it. I remembered the letters on his license plate. Not the numbers, unfortunately, but I googled those and it turned out that he was from a city about six hours away from our village. Mind you, the country I live in is very strict on its lockdown right now, so you're only allowed to travel, even by car, if you have very urgent reasoning. After we reached the first lantern of the next village, we looked back and observed the car driving a bit out of the forest, turning around, and going back inside. I was able to see that he parked there again and turned the lights off. He didn't leave the forest. We went home on a much longer way than initially intended, as I really didn't want to go back there for obvious reasons. Our flashlight battery died on the way, and my phone battery was low, so I didn't want to call the police at that point, but I did call them as soon as I arrived home and I gave them all the details. Huge regret that I didn't memorize the whole license plate, but it was just really surprising. I mean, I also seriously didn't even think about it, and it only just occurred to me as really strange 
when I thought about the frozen windows and that he could impossibly have been walking behind us that time and him having no light, not responding. He just did seem to be sneaking up on us when I had sat down to take that photo. I think I was really lucky to have my partner in the camera and the bright light with me. I don't want to imagine what could have happened if I had been alone. They came before Christmas, beneath the luminous moonlight. Their stories were told on Halloween night. From the earth of their home, where they rested their heads, this singing of carols was disturbing the dead. Up from the ground, then into the night, arose the ghosts of the past, a frightening sight. The children all ran to hide in their beds, holding tight to the bedsheets, covering their heads. And still one had wandered, one child without fear. She opened the door to see who was knocking out there. Her mother had gasped as father held tight behind the skirt of dear mother before the figures in sight. They came in great numbers, their reason unclear. They came without warning to give them a scare. Yet the young heart was laughing as she reached out with the tears. For Uncle Ned and the family once again are all here. Soon the town people all slowly emerged. They opened their doorways to see what they heard. There was laughter and joy in the town's village square, and all sang out loudly as though no one cared. The dead and the living, once again all unite. A merry, scary Christmas to all, and to all, sleepless night. was the eve of the Krampus, and black as the night. Santa's dark helper was up to a fright. The stockings were hung with ill-fated hope, for Santa's great list marked these children nope. So down swept the Krampus from razor-cold wind, to whip at the wicked and sentence the sin. Upon his hunched back and basket was perched, laden with switches and branches of birch. His hooves were a cloven, his horns like a goat. All covered with blackened and matted fur coat. He slithers and slinks, smelling of dung. He sniffs at the air and uncoils his tongue. As long as your arms and red as your blood, Dripping saliva a venomous flood. He scatters through windows and cracks under doors. He crawls down the chimneys and claws up through floors. He stalks the impertinent, bullies and thieves. He finds all the children that Santa's sleigh leaves. The ones who are naughty, or who disobey, he scoops from their beds, and he carries away. Those who are foul and cause parents grief, those that deny any Santa belief. He pulls at their ears and drowns them in ink. He uses a pitchfork with hellfire stink. He hands them each off to the elves of the mad, the Eulus Vena, the impish Yule lads. Go stumpy, door slammer, skier gobbler, window peeper, meat hook, and pot scamper, take them to the reaper. Bow liquor, doorway sniffer, gully gawk, sausage swiper, it's high time these children pay tithe to the piper. Spoon liquor, candle stealer, and last sheep coat clot, tonight without mercy we shall spare no rot. He'll take his birch branches, and with them he'll beat, and hang their young corpses up by their small feet. He'll swing them around, and choke them with chain. He'll wake them back up, and do it again. And when he is done, he'll send their damned souls, to do painful penance by miming hot coal, found in Hades' depths to serve as a warning, stuffed in a stocking to find Christmas morning. Absconding in darkness from which forged his heart, he growls and he cackles his toothy grin parts. Saints Nick and I listen, your lies will be caught. So Merry Christmas to all, or else crump a snotch. There is snow on the ground, and the valleys are cold, and a midnight profound blackly squats o'er the world. But a light on the hilltops have seen hints of feastings unhallowed and old. There is death in the clouds, there is fear in the night. 
For the dead in their shrouds hail the sun's turning flight, and chant wild in the woods as they dance round a yule altar, fungus and white. To no gale of earth's kind sways the forest of oak, with the sick boughs entwined by the mad mistletoe's choke. For these powers are the powers of the dark from the graves of the lost druid folk. And mayest thou to such deeds be an abbot and priest, singing cannibal greeds at each devil-wrought feast. Into all the incredulous world showing dimly the sign of the beast. This happened in the year 1989 when I was nine years old. I lived in a middle-class neighborhood in Forest, West Virginia. It was a Mayberry-like neighborhood. Most everyone knew each other. No crime, lots of families. Not everyone locked their doors at night. There were lots of kids my age in the neighborhood, but the two on my street were my closest friends, Mitchell and Chase. The three of us were sort of a clique. Whenever a new kid moved into the neighborhood, we liked to go see him together, to see what he was like and decide if he was cool or not. That year, a new family moved into a house near the end of the street. They had just one child, a boy named Parker. We invited him out to play a few times. He seemed cool, so before long, he was almost one of the crew. Parker's mom was attractive, blonde, slim, always smiling. However, his dad was not a friendly man. He seemed annoyed by us kids, he rarely spoke to us, and mostly just acknowledged us with eye rolls and grunts. He also didn't come outside much. He worked nights, so we didn't see him often during the week, and on the weekends, he was mostly banging around in his garage. One Saturday afternoon in the fall, Mitch and Chase were both away for some reason, so I went over to Parker's house alone to see if he wanted to play. He said his parents weren't home and invited me inside. That was a really strange experience for me. At nine, my parents never left me alone. They would call babysitter over if they were gonna be gone for even an hour. I asked Parker why he was home alone and made no secret that I was weirded out about it, but he seemed totally fine with it, like it happened all the time. So that put me at ease. We watched TV for a few minutes. Then abruptly, Parker got off the couch and said, hey, you wanna see something cool? Sure, I said. He led me down to the basement, pointed out a tool chest against the wall. They're in here. Parker opened up the bottom cupboard drawer of the tool chest, revealing a huge stack of Playboys. There had to have been 50 or 60 issues in there. I had no idea what I was even looking at. I had never seen a naked woman before. The closest I had come was seeing the scantily clad Tanya Roberts in the movie The Beast Maker. I remember watching that movie and being vaguely intrigued by the female form, but what I saw in the Playboys were sort of repulsive. It wasn't necessarily the images of the naked women that churned my stomach, but the dank and musty smell of the basement, the dim lights, the crinkled, stiff flaky feel of the magazine pages, as if the moisture of the basement was slowly turning them to pulp. It just felt wrong and gross, and I wanted to leave. Still. I just couldn't stop looking. I'd flip through one magazine, toss it back, then flip through another one. Somehow I had this strange notion that I was getting something valuable for free, so I needed to cram as much into my brain as I could. Finally Parker said, we better get out of here, my mom will be home soon. You can tear some pictures out and take them home if you want. I ripped out one of the centerfolds and stuffed it into my pocket. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't want it for any self-gratification purpose, I just had an idea that I could use it to impress Mitchell and Chase later on. When I got home, I stuffed the balled up centerfold in the back corner of my closet under some toys. Despite not having a deep understanding of what it was, I was certain that if my mom found it, I'd be in big trouble. I went to sleep like normal that evening, but awoke abruptly in the middle of the night to a rough hand shaking my shoulder. 
I immediately knew something was wrong because neither of my parents would have woken me up so firmly. Plus, there was a terrible smell, a rank combination of alcohol and motor oil. I opened up my eyes and with the aid of my bedside nightlight, recognized Parker's dad standing over me. I wanted to cry out, to scream for my dad, but the man glared down at me with so much hatred, so much fury. I was paralyzed. I was certain that if I did cry out, he'd twist my head off my neck. You stole from me, you little jerk, he said in this low voice, low enough not to wake my parents in the other room, but in the quiet of my room, the words rang clear as a bell. His use of the F word was what really struck me. No adult had ever used the F word on me, combined with his tone, expression, and body language. A word just cut me to the bone. I want it back, he said. Numbly, my heart hammering, I quietly and obediently went to my closet and dug out the balled up centerfold from beneath a pile of Ninja Turtles. I held it out to him and he snatched it. At this point, he went on a low, whispery rant at me, including a lecture about thievery and personal property. I don't remember all of it, but it went along the lines of, I'll tell your parents, I'll call the cops, you'll go to juvie, yada yada. But he said two phrases I distinctly remember. One of them was, don't ever come into my house again, don't ever step foot in my yard again. And the other was something that was so strange and said with so much sincerity that it burned into my memory and still haunts me to this day. Don't you ever look at this stuff again as he clenched his fist around the balled up centerfold. It will turn you into something you don't want to be. He then turned and walked silently out of my room. I was so creeped out at how silently he slipped away. Our floors were carpeted and he literally made no sound as he disappeared down the hall into the darkness, like some malicious Santa Claus. It was like he had lots of previous practice at sneaking around, which I found even more disturbing. When I thought back on the incident during the following years, it was that sneaking which haunted me the most of all, even more than that lecture and the threats. How quietly and stealthily he moved, like the Grinch in that cartoon, but not with that big cartoony stride. Like I would never be safe from him no matter where I went in life. Like any time I went to sleep, he would just appear there without a sound and I'd never hear him coming. The holiday season was always the busiest time of year for us postal workers, of course. People shifting gifts, cards going out, our workload doubled in December at the very least. But after the bizarre incident I had, delivering packages a few days before Christmas several years back, I started to dread those festive months. Even now, I get anxious doing my route when the holidays roll around. I'd worked for the post office in my hometown for over a decade when this went down. I really enjoyed it for the most part. Sure, the job could be stressful, especially during holiday crunch, but I liked the feeling of providing an important service, being out and about delivering letters and parcels. It suited my tendencies as a creature of habit. I even had my route down to a science, knowing exactly how long each block would take. In 2015, the week before Christmas was an absolute madhouse, as usual. Every day, my truck was packed floor to ceiling with boxes and overflowing bags of mail. The packages were especially out of control. It seemed like every individual in the town was getting online gifts shipped from retailers. By December 23rd, I was exhausted from the non-stop influx. My route that day was crammed with over 300 packages needing delivery, all locked and loaded in the back of my truck. As I set out, light snow started to fall adding an extra challenge. I knew this was going to be a long slog. Taking my time despite being worn out, I methodically worked my way down each street, dropping off boxes and envelopes at every address. The neighborhood I was in had a lot of cute older homes decked out for the holidays with lights and inflatables. It helped to brighten the dreary weather we were having. 
About two hours in, I pulled up to a yellow two-story house on Walnut Street that had an unusually large pile of boxes waiting on the porch. I parked and gathered the things I would be delivering. As I arranged them on the welcome mat, I noticed the door was cracked about an inch. Through the gap, there was only darkness inside. Feeling uneasy, I rang the bell and knocked, calling out a greeting. No response, no movement from within. I checked the shipping labels, verifying this was indeed the correct address they were delivered to. Glancing around behind me, the whole block seemed oddly still and quiet. When I peered back through the door crack, it was pitch dark. Not a single light on in there. A prickle of dread crept up my spine. I knew something wasn't right here. My instinct was to call the police, but without enough evidence of anything actually wrong happening, besides a dark house and open door and piled packages, I didn't know if they would even respond. I went back to my truck and deliberated what to do. Starting to drive away didn't sit right with me. What if someone inside was hurt? I decided I had to check to be sure. Taking a deep breath, I slowly pushed the front door all the way open and looked around. I called out who I was, that I was there to deliver packages from the USPS. No reply came back. Turning on my phone flashlight, I waved the beam around over everything. The front rooms were orderly, if sparsely furnished. A fine layer of dust-coated surfaces hinted no one had been there in a while. I took tentative steps down the hallway, checking each room as I went. Bedrooms and kitchen were just as neatly abandoned, but no sign of who belonged there or where they'd gone. It was like the occupants had simply vanished without taking anything. The further I explored each empty room, the more ominous the atmosphere felt. Disturbingly, there was also no holiday decor or anything to suggest people who lived here had been planning to celebrate, which might have been the case considering all the packages they'd had delivered. Just an empty shell of a suburban home. As I approached the closed door at the end of the hall, my dread peaked. I knew that if there was any evidence of what happened to the occupants, it would be behind that final barrier. Every instinct I had told me to turn back, but I'd come this far. I had to know. With a deep breath, I turned the knob and pushed it open. The stench hit me first, decay and bodily waste. Resisting nausea, I shone my light into what looked like a child's room. It was empty, except for a small shape curled up in the corner. My heart dropped when the beam illuminated a young girl, motionless and facing the wall. I took a step closer, dreading but expecting the worst. That's when her head turned sharply towards me. Eyes wild, clouded white, blood around cracked lips. My light reflected off something clutched in her hand, torn flesh hanging from exposed bone. I recoiled in horror as a strangled inhuman growl erupted from the girl. Every cell in my body screamed to run. I backpedaled just as she lunged, narrowly missing my wrist as I crashed through the doorway. The sound that came from her, part shriek, part gurgling snarl, assailed my ears as I fled down the hall. Bursting outside, I slammed the front door behind me. Through it came anguished cries as I half tumbled into my truck and sped off down the street. My mind was in shambles trying to process what I'd witnessed in that innocuous suburban home. I drove straight to the police station in shock. My report brought a swarm of vehicles onto Walnut Street along with an ambulance. But when they entered the home, there was no sign of the girl having been there. Just an abandoned home, doors now locked and no clues left behind. With no proof besides my word, the cops wrote it off as holiday stress, or perhaps an encounter with a home intruder during a delivery. But I knew what I saw. Those soulless eyes staring back still haunt me to this day. I put in for a new route the next week, wanting no part of that neighborhood again. For a couple of years afterwards around Christmas, families on Walnut Street reported sounds of anguished cries coming from inside the walls of the empty house each night. But by morning, silence returned. Eventually, the home would be demolished. An evil that dark leaves wounds beyond the physical. I still don't know what happened there, 
But some nights when I close my eyes, I feel like I can see that little girl's twisted face leering back from the darkness. Just remembering what was in that house is enough to make my blood run cold. Today was the annual holiday potluck. My office doesn't really do parties, but every occasion gets a potluck. It's business as usual, except everyone brings food. We work while stuffing ourselves silly. Nothing like working through a stomachache, right? It's always a game of food poisoning roulette. Since I was the first one in, I was expected to do the basic setup, dutifully. I cleared off the sorting table and got the coffee going, and I expected to spend the first 30 minutes of my shift in peace, but it wasn't to be. The phone started ringing. It's too early for this, I thought. I answered anyway, putting on my best customer service voice. At this hour, most customers hadn't even had their coffee yet, so answering the phone was a crapshoot. Fortunately, it was only Carol. Thank God you answered. Can you let me in? My arms are full. She always bought enough baked goods for everyone to have seconds and thirds. It was one of the few things I looked forward to. I'll be right over. Hold on. I hung up and hurried over to the employee entrance, yanked the door open, and found Carol standing there with a heaping sack of Tupperware in her arms. The scent of gingerbread hung around her like a warm Christmas perfume sweet and inviting. Let me help you with that. You tried to get it all in one trip, huh? I carefully grabbed a few containers, making sure not to tip them over, and walking with her inside. Carol smiled appreciatively, relieved she could finally set everything down. I took a peek at the goodies. As expected, gingerbread cookies. Gingerbread office workers, each one bigger than my hand, and intricately detailed. What do you think? She asked, puffing out her chest with pride. I made one for everyone at the office. After I passed these out, I'm out of here though. I'm not working today, but I wanted to make sure everyone got theirs. Wow. I admired her handiwork. It took me only a moment to realize that the gingerbread cookies were modeled after all of our co-workers. I looked eagerly for the one she'd made me, but didn't see it. These must have taken you forever. The details are perfect, no one can top these. Suddenly, my crock pot of meatballs seemed a lot less exciting. Oh well, it wasn't a competition. As if I could beat Carol's Christmas cookies. By then my phone started to ring, so I hurried back to my desk. I watched Carol pass out her cookies with care, placing them on desks atop pretty poinsettia plates. Are you going to be open on Christmas? The customer asked the second I picked up. No hello, only a shrill inquiry. No, but we will be open on the 26th, I answered. What do you mean you won't be open on Christmas? What if I need help right away? I'll have to wait? I gave my scripted answer to the angry customer, distracted and deadpan. By the time the call was done, Carol came over with a smile, bringing the very last cookie over to me. I'd say it's too pretty to eat, Except he was never really a looker, was he? I looked down at the gingerbread man. It wasn't me. It was our boss, Dale. This one's mine? I asked tentatively, definitely confused. Maybe there was a mistake. Of course! How many opportunities do you get to bite your boss's head off? I wanted to give you the honor. If Carol sensed my disappointment, she didn't let on. I looked down at the cookie again a dense gingerbread man in a cheap suit. Even though the suit had been made with glaze and frosting, I had that impression, cheap, ill-fitting and gray, a perfect replica of one of his two suits with a garnished Christmas tie. As long as it doesn't taste like Dale, I laughed. To be honest, as perfectly made as the cookie was, I didn't find it appetizing. Well, it did smell amazing. But there was something off-putting about eating a cookie shaped like someone, especially Dale. Then again, it would be just as weird to eat one that looked like me. Cookie cannibalism. 
You didn't give him one that looked like me, right? I shudder. Now that would be creepy. Dale was a piece of work, but I had to tolerate him if I wanted to keep my job. Of course not, Harold assured me. Could you do me a favor? Wait until everyone else gets here before you eat it. I want everyone to see. I wish I could see the looks on their faces. You'll tell me, won't you? Sure. I stood the gingerbread away from me. To be honest, I wasn't sure if I was going to eat it or not, but I didn't want to hurt her feelings. Maybe if I scraped the decorations off first. That, however, seemed equally rude. When you eat gingerbread cookies, are you the kind of person that goes for the head, or the arms, or the legs first? Or maybe you pull off the decorations one by one? She asked, suddenly. Carol wasn't looking at me when she asked. She was looking towards Dale's office. What a weird question, especially coming from her. When she saw the look on my face, Carol laughed and patted my shoulder. Sorry, I was just having a funny thought. There's a little sadist in everyone, isn't there? Excuse me? Grabbing her empty Tupperware, Carol gave me a wink, wished me a Merry Christmas and left, leaving me alone in the office. I kept eyeing the gingerbread Dale, still feeling a bit weird about it. Weird, but also hungry. The cookies smelled divine, which was odd considering I'd never been a fan of gingerbread. About ten minutes later, the rest of my co-workers trickled in. They complained about how tired they were, morning traffic and the holidays. Of course, the belly aching became exclamations of delight when they discovered the cookies set neatly on their desks. Everyone started showing one another their cookies and taking pictures, marveling at the perfect detail. Patty's cookie had her trademark beehive updo and pearls. Mark's cookie was bearded with square glasses and Betty had electric blue eyeshadow and dimples. Though the outfits weren't an exact match, the resemblances were uncanny. Eventually the clamor died down as everyone sat at their desks, all except Patty, who scurried over to my desk with a wide smile. I didn't see yours, she said, showing me hers for the second time. She carried her plate proudly in both hands, like she was presenting a piece of art. To be fair, Carol's work really was exquisite. I just didn't like Patty. Patty's eyes moved to the plate I'd set away from me. My cookie wasn't like everyone else's, which suddenly seemed like a problem. Oh, it looks like Dale. Is it yours? She scrunched her face at me, somehow managing to keep the smile. I didn't like her insinuation. Yeah, it's mine. Did she really think I'd scoff down a cookie and stole another one's off my boss's desk? Really? Why doesn't it look like you then? Oh yeah, the insinuation was there. A bit of anger spread across my tongue, but I fought to keep my voice level and my face flat. It was weird that I was the only one with a cookie that looked like someone else, but I didn't make them, it wasn't up to me. Carol thought it would be funny, that's all. Carol? Uh wasn't she fired yesterday? Patty's expression scrunched up even more. Her hands moved up her pearls, fidgeting with the long strand. Sometimes I wonder if she wore pearls just so that she would clutch them. Uh, no. Wouldn't I have a memo if she was? I turned my attention back to work. I hoped Patty would get the hint and go away. But she stood there for a long moment, sucking in a deep, dramatic breath. She picked her plate off my desk, staring hard at the gingerbread patty. Didn't you make these? She asked slowly. No, I brought the meatballs. Why would you think I made them? I answered, not looking up, pretending to read an email. Paddy was being nosy, as usual. I'd never liked that about her. She didn't have anything better to do, I guess, except for the work she let pile up. But if I'd said that, she'd complain to Dale. Patty was his favorite for some reason, so I'd probably get written up for not being a team player, like a lot of offices around the world. This one was toxic. I'm not sure if this is okay. I'll be right back, Patty said, unaware of my rude thoughts. I looked up when she said that, unable to help myself. She didn't explain pivoting towards Dale's office. To tell me, or Carol, I honestly wasn't sure. Either way, it was a headache for me. She reappeared in the doorway with Dale a moment later. 
They both made a beeline straight for my desk, their expressions a lot more serious than a cookie called for. Great. I pretended not to notice, busying myself with a stack of fresh paperwork. Before they reached me, there was a loud cracking sound and a scream. Every head in the room whipped in my direction of the sound to find Robert, tears running down his face. All I could see were his eyes poking up from his workstation, expression twisted and red. My arm, he screamed. Oh my god, it won't move. A couple of co-workers ran over to see what happened. I reached for my phone instead, ready to dial 911 if an ambulance was needed. Patty and Dale changed course, but everyone looked confused. How on earth had Robert hurt his arm while sitting at his desk? Carpal tunnel? Now's your chance, came an errant thought. My eyes slid towards the gingerbread Dale. It looked perfectly palatable on that pretty poinsettia plate. Hurry before they confiscate it. Now wasn't the time to worry about cookies, but my tongue tingled with anticipation and my teeth itched with the urge. Just a bite. It was a strange urge, almost like it wasn't my own but very compelling. The gingerbread man was heavier than I expected. I lifted it to my lips and bit off one of the feet. It crunched in stereo, unusually loud, and the foot snapped off and began melting in my tongue. Delicious. A rush of delight washed over me, brought on by a flood of favor that drowned out Dale's cursing screams. He'd fallen rocking back and forth on the floor. He must have twisted his ankle in his haste to check on Robert. How unlucky. Two injuries in one day. A choir of all oh my gods rang out through the office, but I set down my phone so that I could hold up the gingerbread Dale in both hands. Without even thinking, I took another bite, nibbling up the leg before switching to the other foot. The screaming kept getting louder, filling the room. The gingerbread had such a rich and complex flavor. Gingerbread, cinnamon, allspice, cloves, and something else. It was earthy. Or maybe was it the soft texture, soft and velvety, yet dense and crunchy. Wow, so much screaming, all over carpal tunnel and a sprained ankle. Annoyed, I glanced around the room to find almost everyone was screaming. The ones who weren't screaming were chewing with blissed out looks on their bloody faces or slumped over their desks. Confused, I touched my own wet mouth and looked down at my red fingers. I wasn't in any pain. Had Carol put glass in the batter or something? Where was the blood coming from? Why was everyone still eating? Because they couldn't help themselves. I couldn't help myself either. Without realizing it, I'd eaten half of the Dale cookie and found myself going in for another bite. Horrified, I dropped the cookie. The gingerbread snapped in half as it hit the floor. Dale curled up on the carpet and suddenly was still and quiet. Patty was right next to him on the floor, but she didn't seem to notice, chewing frantically with glazed eyes, gingerbread crumbs and blood running down her chin. When only her mouth was empty, did she resume screaming again. She rolled and started eating her cookie off the carpet. The spell the cookie cast on me had broken with my boss's spine. He was dead. And with each quieted scream, a co-worker joined him in death. I was the last one standing, the last one screaming. Soon, I was standing in perfect silence. No more screams, no more chewing. Only then, was I able to move. I grabbed my keys and ran out the office. Maybe I should have called the police, but I didn't know what I was going to tell them. That Carol's Christmas cookies had killed everyone but me? That I chewed my boss to death with a voodoo gingerbread man? I couldn't come up with a logical explanation in the state of my pure panic. Even though my voice had broken, my thoughts kept screaming. I ran through the snowy parking lot and found my car. I'm not sure why I ran. No one was chasing me. There was no one who could. Before I could jump into my car and drive away, I noticed the little red gift bag sitting on the hood of my car. Written in glitter were the words, Merry Christmas, from Carol. I was terrified, but looked inside the bag anyway. 
As I feared, there was a cookie. My heart thudded in terror, but I felt compelled to examine it. In spite of my dread, I started to salivate, clenching my teeth together. Even after what I witnessed, I wanted to eat it. The cookie wasn't me. It was Carol. Carol down to the outfit she'd worn that very morning, except for the sorry piped across her sweater and red. I swallowed the bloody spit in my mouth, reached back into the gift bag, and there was a Christmas card inside. Still holding the gingerbread carol, I opened it up. A key was taped inside along with a simple message. Merry Christmas. There's a gingerbread office in my apartment. If you smash it, everyone will think the roof collapsed. That should explain all the broken bones. Don't worry, no one will find me. You were always kind to me, that's why I spared you. I hope you do me one more kindness and make it quick. Love, Carol. I closed the card, tucking it back in the envelope and sitting in my car. I looked down at the cookie still in my hand. My tongue tingled. My teeth itched. I didn't want to do it, but I had to. I bit off Carol's gingerbread head. It tasted like gingerbread and death. This happened 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve, and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. Therefore, I would be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so, and I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest. There are parts of it that are completely unlit, but nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There's a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road is a thick forest. The only thing that we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drove down the hill, crossed the bridge, then back uphill through more forest. It was when the highway begins to flatten out again that it happened. Something sprints across the road. So quickly, I nearly hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend. Hey, did you just see that? She confirmed that she had, but couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote. They're a fairly common sight around this area, but something fell off about this entire situation. Whatever it was ran out in front of the car, then disappeared into the woods. Coyotes usually don't dart out in front of cars like that. So, for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turn the car around and switch on the high beams to illuminate the forest. I then step out of the car and began walking towards the woods. I don't see anything. But as I drew closer to the tree line, it feels like perhaps I had made a grave mistake. My heart was pounding, and the hairs on the back of my neck were now standing at full attention. I don't see anything unusual in the trees. Then suddenly, the car horn blasts. I hurry back to the car and ask my girlfriend what was going on. She didn't say anything. Instead, she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I look over in that direction, and that's when I saw it. 
Without a doubt, this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It appeared to be a man, completely naked. His skin was covered in mud, and in one of his hands, he was holding a hatchet. He looked back at us, and then he smiled, then waved, just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there. Once we were safely on the road again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for the man in the direction that he initially vanished in, he circled around and came out from another spot in the forest beyond the car's headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she spotted him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking toward me, his hatchet raised as if making to strike me. We called the authorities once we safely got back home, but they never found anybody. The officer we spoke to explained his theory. The man was looking to ambush unsuspecting travelers. We all agreed that my girlfriend's quick thinking saved my life that night, as it let my potential murderer know that I wasn't alone out there. I moved back into that area recently, so now I drive on that highway often. There hasn't been any naked hatchet man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely extra vigilant now, especially whenever I'm near Deep Creek. Mommy, what are you doing? I'm brining the turkey. What's brining? I soak the turkey in salt water and... Why? Hey, I said, tightening the strings on my apron. Why don't you go play with the Starman toy I got you? I don't want to play with it anymore. Kids these days lose interest in a new toy in an hour. Want to watch Mommy take out the Christmas cookies? I pulled the tray out of the oven. Heat nipped at my fingers. The cookie Jackson made was burned at the edges and terribly misshapen. Your cookie turned out great, see? Can I eat it now? He asked, his grimy little hands shooting for it. I thought it was for Santa. Well, it was, but I'm hungry. And, and if everyone else is feeding Santa cookies, he, he doesn't really need mine, right? Smart kid. I led him to the dining room with the cookie and a tall glass of milk. Here you go, honey. He sat down. I glanced out the window. Christmas lights from the house across the street twinkled back in the falling dusk. I patted him on the shoulder and began to walk away. Mommy! Ugh, what now? Yes, Jackson? I hear jingling of Santa's reindeer. That's nice, I said. Probably just that old man next door walking his corgi, but whatever. I'm not going to rain on his parade. I'm going to listen to the reindeer. Thank God. Finally, something to keep him busy. I returned to the kitchen and frowned at the turkey. It looked so pale and slimy. My mother would be here tomorrow and she was so particular about it. Don't overcook it, it'll be too dry. And don't put too much salt. Nobody likes a salty turkey. And don't burn it. Oh my goodness, don't burn it. Her voice echoed in my head. Dave made such a perfect, wonderful turkey last year. The way he seasoned it, ah, it was exquisite. Yeah, well, then I caught Dave seasoning someone else's turkey, so to speak. Mommy, I hear them. He shouted. That's great, I call back. Dave's attempts to reconcile were, to say the least, lacking. Sometimes he'd leave me a voicemail, just saying, I love you, then hanging up. Other times he'd text me a photo of his hand wearing the wedding ring. No caption, nothing else in the picture, just his hand. 
The ring was so stupid looking anyway. Silver encrusted with a ton of tiny garnets. Because red is the color of love. Yeah, well, red is also the color I saw when I found them. But mommy, I hear them. The jingling and the footsteps. Th uh, that's great, honey. Listen, listen. I sighed and rinsed the slime off my hands. Okay, okay, Jackson, I'm coming, I said, stepping into the dining room. I listened. Jingle, jingle. It froze. My heart began to pound. Santa's here, see? He squealed. Jingle, jingle. It wasn't the jingling of bells or a leash. It was the jingling of keys as someone tried the lock. I grabbed Jackson's arm and dragged him out of the dining room. Mommy, what are you doing? Uh, we're going to sit here and wait for Santa to come down the chimney. See? I said, my voice quavering. I eyed the back door. Could we make a run for it? Thump. Thump. He's on the roof! Jackson squealed, grinning. Thump. Thump. I hugged Jackson, holding him as close as I could. Thump. I screamed. Jackson broke free from my arms and ran toward the chimney. Then I saw it. A small box wrapped in black paper had fallen in through the fireplace. Jackson, no! It was too late. He picked it up, grinning. Then he frowned. It's not mine. He shoved it into my lap. It's for you, Mommy. Hands shaking, I picked it up. The note read, You changed the locks. My heart pounding, I lifted the lid of the box. A ring, encrusted with a thousand tiny garnets. One hour until midnight, John shouted as he ran through the living room. I glanced towards the small closet in the hallway. The door had been removed and propped up against the opposite wall as usual, and the mistletoe had been hung up in the center of the doorway. The closet was empty, and there was no light coming from inside. I held on to my glass of water, nervous. I never drink at the annual holiday party. The things we were about to see were bad enough sober, and I couldn't even imagine what it would be like if I were drunk. I looked over at Mel, who was smoking a joint, as she did every year. I'm not sure how she managed to get through the events of the night, but maybe being high helped her process what she saw. John ran back through the living room, stopping to make sure all of the windows were locked and all of the curtains were shut. He walked over to the front door, rattling the doorknob and pulling on the door to make sure that it too was locked before making his way into the kitchen. The rest of us, Ben, Alma, Mel, and I sat around the living room in silence. Even though we had done this every year for the last three years, it wasn't something you could easily get used to. The horrors that we would witness tonight wouldn't be anything like the horrors from last year or the year before. We took over this ritual from our parents, who had passed it on to us when we turned 18. Ever since then, we have made sure that every year on Christmas Eve, we gather at John's house to make sure that we keep all of the holiday horrors away from the rest of you. The drugs and the food are only here to distract us, although it hardly ever works. We all gather on the day before Christmas Eve, a few minutes before midnight and we stay inside John's house until midnight on Christmas night. It doesn't always start at the same time, but never before 1 p.m. on Christmas Eve. So we always make sure that we are inside the house and that all of the exits are locked tight before the fun starts. I use the word fun very loosely here. I set my glass of water down as Mel passed by me, letting us know she was going to pee before it all started. She came back fairly quickly and plopped back down on the couch, sighing. Mel was always annoyed that we had to do this. She didn't seem as affected by it as the rest of us, 
and would usually spend most of the month of December complaining about the holiday party. John! Ben shouted suddenly. It's starting! I looked back at the closet. Ben was right. It was starting. And standing in the threshold under the mistletoe was a creature whose top half was a reindeer with the bottom half of a nude human male. It stood there, looking towards us. Its head had a big hole where its left eye should have been as if it had been shot there, and there was dried blood all over its face. Its left antler was broken in half, and I could see some bugs crawling around the wound in its face. We just stood there, watching it as it watched us. It retreated back into the closet before it got down on all fours and charged towards us. I still flinched even though I knew it couldn't make it more than a few feet away from the closet. I remember asking my parents once why we had to make sure all the exits were locked, even though most of the monsters couldn't get more than a few feet away from the mistletoe. They didn't give me a direct answer, only making sure that everything was locked guaranteed that nothing would get out. It continued to charge towards us, ramming into the invisible barriers each time. Then, just as it had randomly appeared, the creature randomly disappeared and there was a few minutes of empty silence. No one said a word, but we all watched as the next creature appeared. This one was human, but there was something wrong with him, as usual. The man had been flattened down to resemble the shape of a gingerbread man. He had large rotting gumdrops that were meant to be gingerbread buttons sewed down his front. His mouth had been pulled back at the corners with some sort of metal hoops that pierced through his skin in order to give him a permanent smile. He waddled from side to side as he attempted to balance on his flattened feet. As he tried to walk out of the closet, his arms got stuck in the doorway and he ran into it over and over, slamming himself into it harder and harder each time until there was a sickening crunching noise and his arms flopped backwards. He finally waddled through the doorway and this time he made it out further than the first creature had and began waddling towards us. I took a few steps back as the man continued to waddle towards the living room. Suddenly, a branch pierced through his chest from the back and he was violently pulled back into the closet where he disappeared. That was immediately followed by dozens of branches that snaked their way around the floor of the house, climbing up the walls as they made their way around the house. The branches were covered in the sharpest pine needles I had ever seen with a few random broken ornaments hanging off them. I jumped up onto a couch as the branches made their way into the living room, and everyone else followed my lead as we watched the branches weave in and out of the floorboards. Suddenly, Alma screamed, and I turned towards her. Some of the branches had wrapped around the legs of the chair she was on, and she was being pulled towards the closet. John attempted to reach out for her as she was dragged past him. But the branches began to snake up and intertwine until they then created a sort of protective dome around the chair, trapping Alma inside. She continued to yell as I tried to figure out a way to get to her without the branches getting to me, but it seemed impossible. It was like the branches had a mind of their own and were making sure that none of us could help Alma. We watched as she was dragged into the closet along with the chairs before the branches finally retreated. What was that? They've never taken any of us before, Ben said. No one replied as we continued to watch the closet. Suddenly, Alma leaped out and ran out, but was then stopped a few feet away from the doorway. What? She shouted, now panicked. Let me out! John leaped off the coffee table and ran over, grabbing a hold of Alma's hand and attempting to pull her away from the doorway, but he couldn't. Don't leave me here! Please help me! Alma sobbed. Ben ran over and tried to help John, but something was holding Alma back and stopping them from pulling her away. Ow! Alma shouted suddenly. I ran over as Mel followed. What happened? I asked. I don't know. Did we pull too hard? John asked Alma. Ow! Alma shouted yet again louder this time. Alma, what's wrong? I asked. It hurts, 
She then shouted as she fell to her knees. We watched as she continued to shout in pain, and then we realized what was happening. Her skin was being peeled off in one large chunk. Her biceps had been exposed as the skin continued to peel from the back to the front until everything, including her face, came off. Alma continued to scream the whole time, even after her skin was off. Her skin began crawling towards us as she screamed and cried in the background, and it all started to make sense why John's parents had told him to find a remote area to host the parties at. We began to back away as her skin continued to crawl towards us. I soon realized that it was heading towards John specifically, and he backed into a wall as it continued to snake towards him, climbing up his body. It was at this point that I realized that Alma had stopped screaming, and I turned just in time to see her limp body being dragged back into the closet. It looked like she was dead. I started to get anxious then. None of the things we witnessed had ever affected us this much. Usually some of us would walk away with some scratches, but nothing this permanent. I took a deep breath as I tried to ignore the voice in the brain that was screaming at me to get out of the house as soon as possible but I knew that I couldn't. I could have let all of these things out into the world. I turned back to look at John as Alma's skin began wrapping itself around his torso until it then tightened and formed a weird skin sweater all around him. John started to gag and I looked away as I'd felt the urge to vomit. John began freaking out and I looked back to see him attempting to peel the skin sweater off of his body. Every time he pulled part of it off, it began to bleed until his hands and legs were covered in blood. He started to cry, scratching at Elma's skin as he tried to desperately peel it off. It did come off eventually, and John kicked it aside as he ran into the kitchen. I heard the faucet open as he continued crying. Oh God! I turned to the sound of Ben's voice to see small elves walking out of the closet. They were dressed in typical green outfits, but they were severely deformed, with different sized heads, arms, and legs. We watched as they all headed towards the pile of Alma's skin. They began to pick it up as they tore off pieces of it with their teeth and then ate it until it was all gone. Then they got on the floor and licked up all the blood before returning back into the closet. There's only five minutes left until midnight, Ben said, breaking the silence. Do you think it's over then? I asked. No, Mal replied. I looked over to see that she was pointing at the closet. I could hear footsteps coming from the inside. Do you feel that? John asked. I turned, not noticing that he had come back from the kitchen. We stood still as I began to notice that the house was getting cold. It continued to drop in temperature until my teeth were now chattering. The footsteps continued, even though nothing appeared. I rubbed my arms as I tried to warm up and began to notice a thin layer of ice appearing on every item in the house. For the next few minutes, the house continued to grow colder and colder until I was sure we were going to die. I could feel my heart being slowed down as my fingers turned blue. My eyes had started to burn from the cold and I could no longer move. Then, just when I thought it was all over. It was gone, and the house warmed up in the blink of an eye. Is it over? I asked. Yeah, it's midnight, Ben replied. Where's Alma? John asked. I carefully walked over to the closet, peering inside. It was empty. There was no sign of Alma anywhere. This has never happened before, Ben said. She's dead, and there's nothing we can do about it, Mel replied curtly. She began to gather her stuff, and we watched as she threw open the front door and then left, slamming the door shut behind her. What do we tell her parents? John asked. I don't know. I shrugged. I should get going too, Ben said suddenly. I could tell that he was about to cry, and I stepped out of his way as he left the house. I could feel tears welling up in my eyes as I then excused myself as I ran upstairs and shut the bathroom door behind me. I splashed cold water on my face as I tried to make sense of what had happened. 
I wondered why this time had been different. As I racked my brain for reasons, I felt a sudden chill as I noticed it was abnormally cold in the bathroom. I turned around as I heard a car start and stood there, staring at the open bathroom window. My heart began to hammer against my chest as my thoughts ran a million miles a minute. I walked over to the window and glanced down just in time to see Elma's car backing out of the driveway. Confused, I stuck my head out of the window and squinted as I tried to make out the driver. As the car turned out into the street, I got a direct view into the driver's seat, where I saw a skinned, blistering red Elma drive off down the road. Mrs. Claus sat in her rocker, a half-completed sweater resting on her lap. The alarm clock on the small table beside her rang its shrill alarm through the warm air of the house, announcing that it was now 1 a.m. She reached for it, hitting the button on top with a light ting and silencing the sound. She cranked the dial back another hour so that it would ring at 2 a.m. This was how we kept track of Santa's journey on Christmas Eve. How are those cookies looking? Chandrell opened the oven door and peered inside. The chocolate chip cookies need another few minutes. She stood and looked at the counter behind her, touching a finger to one of the cooling gingerbread men. But the gingerbread men are ready for decoration. I looked up from my piping. The sugar cookies are almost done too. Mrs. Claus beamed at us before continuing her knitting. Good, good. You girls are such good little elves. The kitchen counters were covered with cooling racks of sugar cookies decorated with red and green frosting, pinwheel cookies with chocolate and coconut layers, and almond shortbread cookies dusted with powdered sugar. Several pies cooled in the window, the chill glass absorbing their heat to create a moist fog that blurred the snowy wonderland outside. I had made apple and pumpkin pies as well as some meat pies with beef left over from the cows we had in the summer. Meat pie wasn't something we normally had at the Christmas feast. But it had been Horth's favorite and I wanted to honor him, to feel like he was included in the celebration. My heart stung at his memory and my eyes watered. I wanted to fall to the floor and cry, but it was Christmas and I had to put on a happy face for the younger elves. I swallowed my pain down and forced myself to smile as I worked. I would be able to cry later in the quiet safety of the barn, away from the observant eyes of Mr. and Mrs. Claus. Once the cookies were finished baking, Chandrell started to roast the Christmas ham. The boys, who were now busying themselves with the stables, had slaughtered the pig earlier that week. Fresh potatoes and corn harvested at the end of the fall and root vegetables from the cellar would complete the feast. Santa always came back on Christmas hungry, even after eating the treats left by little boys and girls all around the world. Once he returned, we'd all celebrate the success of the holiday with him. It would be joyful to have everyone enjoy the sweet and savory treats created by me and Chandrell. This year there were 12 of us elves. Chandrell and I were the eldest. At 19, Chandrell was the oldest elf I had ever known. I had always joked that it had to be her baking skills that kept her alive so long. I was the second eldest at 16. Until Thanksgiving it had been Horeth who had been the second eldest. He had been 17. Horth and I had been very close. Our love ran deep and constant like the river that bordered the North Pole on the South. Being one of the two eldest female elves came with a lot of privileges and responsibilities. We were not only expected to take care of the younger elves, but to help Mrs. Claus with running the house, which meant also the barn and the cellar. We were the only ones that she would entrust to protect the food storages, since some of the younger elves would be less able to fight temptation during times when food was scarce. After Shandrell and me, there was Myron, who was 14. Then there was Eroleth, who had just turned 12, and Zoltarish, who was 11. Kristen was 9, and twins Azorin and Byfarlin were 8. Plufin was 7, and Alec was 4. Then there was Sweet Quaith, who was the second youngest at one year old. And finally there was Precious Little Nim, who was only six months old. 
She was to spend the holiday tucked tight in her crib, drunk on breast milk and dreaming of sugar plums. I had a special bond with Nim because she was the first elf harvested from me. After years of fearing that I wouldn't be able to contribute new elves to the pole, Nim finally came along. My little miracle. When Santa had punished Horeth, I worried he would take his anger out on Nim as well. I begged him to spare her, that it was only me who was a threat to the joyful life at the North Pole. I will always be thankful to Mrs. Claus for saving our lives that night, even if her motives were only driven by concern of our small number. Her frantic cries warned Santa that losing two adult elves would be unwise in the harsh winter months, and even losing one infant would make the future difficult. At Mrs. Claus's pleading, he decided to show us both mercy that day, only locking us in the shed for a week as penance for my failings. See, the North Pole is a wonderland of celebration and joy, but also of discipline and reverence. We elves have few rules we must follow, but disobedience is not an option. Rule number one, do your chores. The eldest female elves looked after the home and the food reserves in the barn and cellar. We baked, cooked, pickled, cleaned, and did all the sewing. The eldest male elves looked after the animals and performed the butchering. Sometimes, under Santa's supervision, the boys would be allowed to travel north toward the mountains to hunt rabbits and deer. Chandrell had always envied their trips away. Neither of us had ever traveled past the tree line. Orith would tell me about the animals and the views that they saw during those trips. We'd sneak to the barn late at night and lie together in the hay. He'd tell me about how rocky and steep the mountains grew as you approached them, and how beautiful the sun was setting over the pole. After their tenth year, elves were expected to help look after the crops and contribute to the harvests. It was tough work for such small bodies, but we all had to do our part. Horth had been so good about helping the little ones with their more difficult chores after he had finished all of his. When they weren't in the fields, they either took care of the younger elves or assisted older elves in the more detailed tasks. This also helped them learn the jobs that they would soon be expected to perform. The youngest elves were in charge of the easier chores, such as taking care of the chickens and collecting eggs or helping with the gardening. When all the elves did their chores, the North Pole ran smoothly, like a well-oiled machine. Even this past year with only 12 of us, we were all able to survive. And it was indeed lucky that Chandrell and Myron were both ripe with the next generation of elves, promising that our numbers would grow again. Rule number two, always be joyful. Mrs. Claus told us that a smile is all you need in this world, that it is a conduit for joy. When we felt bad things, she'd shush us. Santa does not like it when elves cry, she'd warn. But sometimes it was hard, especially for the little ones. We'd remind them to try and be joyful, even when they had stubbed their toe or skinned their knee. But still, the tears would flow around their frowns. We'd tell them that it'd get easier as they'd grow older. They'd sniffle and nod, and we'd smile at them, rewarding their joy with cookies and candy. What I never revealed was that it was difficult to be joyful sometimes, even as an older elf. And so I had to pretend. When Mr. Claus would see my unjoyfulness seeping through my smiling face, he'd tell me to be more like the other elf girls, to be more like Chandrell or Mrs. Claus, whose warm smile never faltered. Mrs. Claus with those icy blue eyes, crinkled permanently by a wide, toothy smile. Mr. and Mrs. Claus said that elves were always joyful, so I used to worry that I was defective. But then I started going to the barn at night with Horeth, and he told me that he wasn't joyful sometimes too. I told him about how I was often not joyful. He looked me deep in the eyes and told me he felt the same. Telling him that oddly made being joyful easier. Rule number three, only Santa may leave the pole. The exception being when he would take the other boys hunting. Otherwise, only Santa was able to come and go. And he didn't leave only on Christmas Eve but he would leave the pole once or twice a month. I once asked Mrs. Claus what Santa did when he left, and she explained that he needed things that we couldn't provide at the North Pole. Despite her unfaltering smile, she'd sympathize with us, the girl elves, on those nights. 
These were the nights when Santa would visit in our room. Most of us wouldn't be able to sleep those nights, not when we knew what was coming. He'd waken the few that could early in the morning, our thin door banging against the wall. The sound would always vibrate through my bones as a sour scent permeated the room, making the warm air heavy over my mouth, forever forced into a smile. He'd pick one or two of the girl elves and carry us out to the shed where he would ready us for harvesting new elves. It wasn't at all like when Horth and I would go to the barn. That was soft and painless. It hurt when Santa sewed us. I was lucky though. Chandrell was his favorite, so I was often left alone. There was an unspoken fourth rule at the pole, that only Santa may harvest his elves. We were supposed to be pure. But Horeth and I loved each other. We loved each other so much that our bodies ached to be together. And then Mr. Claus found us. He had been so proud of me too. So proud that I had finally provided fruit for him and Mrs. Claus. It was then that he took Horeth to the shed. That was the last time I saw my love. His face twisted in fear and pain as Santa dragged him through the cold dead leaves. I cried for him openly. Mrs. Claus allowed it, even though it was not joy. She had always been much kinder than Santa. The alarm rang at 6 a.m. Mrs. Claus stopped her knitting and stood at the window, looking out at the winter scape around us. Worry furrowed her brow, slightly wrinkling her otherwise joyful face. Santa Claus had never been this late getting home before. At 11 a.m., Mrs. Claus let us eat some of the feast that we had prepared so we wouldn't have to go to bed with empty stomachs. I couldn't sleep, though. Instead, I listened to her walk back and forth by the front windows, waiting for him. At 3 p.m., the other girl elves and I joined her in the living room. At this point, she was curled up on her rocking chair. She wasn't crying, which I was surprised by. Despite rule number two, I understand the hurt that happens when someone you love doesn't come back. Yet instead, Mrs. Claus rocked back and forth, her eyes glazed, staring out into nothing. She was unresponsive, her lips drawn tight, making her grin look dehydrated and skeletal. By the time 5 p.m. hit, we abandoned her to feed the younger elves more of the Christmas feast which now lay cold on the table. At 8 p.m., Chandrell called out for me to join her at the window. I hugged Nim close to my chest as I walked over to see. Chandrell pointed, and I immediately saw the shadowy figure which had just emerged from the tree lines. Mrs. Claus jumped from her chair, pushing us aside to look. Oh, thank God! He's back! She cried, the practiced smile of joy stretching her face wide again. We continued to look over her shoulder as another shadowy figure appeared followed by another. Soon, several shadows were walking towards the house. Mrs. Claus's face went pale and, for the first time, her smile wavered. It felt as if ice was running down my spine. She ran to the back of the house and came barreling back moments later with a large shotgun. She brandished the weapon in front of her as she ran out of the door wearing nothing but her house coat and slippers. There was a loud bang, and she fell into the snow quickly turned red around her. We were too stunned to react. Within seconds, strange men were around us, touching us and asking us questions in short barks. Chandrell smiled widely at them, asking them if they wanted some cookies or Christmas cheer. Nim and I were the only ones who cried. I haven't seen any other elves since. The men let me keep Nim though, which I appreciate. They gave me a cup of water and a cup of some warm brown liquid I assumed was hot cocoa, but it was bitter and earthy. I spit it out and the men took it away. They asked me a lot of questions, many of which I didn't understand. It was like they were speaking a different language. They asked me who my mother and father are, but I don't know what those words mean. I asked if I could go back to the North Pole, but the men only clenched their jaws without answering. Their features were sharp and their flesh was not snowy white. They were not elves. They all looked different. It was difficult to keep them straight. They were all odd looking. 
and each of them looked old. Much older than Mrs. Claus. They looked like they were Santa's age. I am alone now. This place is too bright, too cold, too metallic. The light hurts my eyes and the coldness gnaws at my bones. Tears bite at my cheeks. I try to smile, but it is hard to even pretend to feel joy here. The warmth of Nim on my chest is the only comfort I have. She squirms and I look down at her and try again to smile. She looks up at me and her large, wet eyes search my features before lighting up with recognition. She smiles at me and my heart lightens. I see Horth's smile in hers, and for the first time since he died, my smile feels real. I remember it like yesterday. Just eight, maybe ten, staring at the dark sky and trying to spot Santa Claus. My mother was holding me in her lap, pointing at every little shadow that passed in front of the moon. We lived in a small town, away from the world, with only two neighbors around us. Her knee bounced in the cold. I remember making roaring noises, pretending I was a dragon as I blew hot vapor out of my mouth. She always giggled at me when I did silly things like this. I loved making her giggle. Snow absolutely covered the ground, and being the wild child that I was, I began kicking it into the air. Little snowflakes stuck in my hair. My mother clapped. If only your father was here, she'd say with wet eyes. The truth was, they weren't together. My brother lived with him, and I with my mother. They agreed to always have the two of us together for holidays, but my father had yet to follow up on that promise. Running up to her, yelling into the night, and looking up at the full moon was enough for me. I missed my brother, but not more than I wanted to see Santa. When you're young, the important things don't seem as important after all. Mom, do you think Santa will bring me what I wished for? I pestered her constantly with this question. Her red cheeks pulled up and her eyes closed. Oh dear, I'm not sure. How good have you been? Joke. It always made me reflect. I've been really good, I swear! All my teachers love me. Her arms were strong like any single mom's arms would be. I loved being held, baby, but not that night. I had to watch. I wiggled out of her arms just past midnight and ran out towards the moon again. Ho ho ho! Merry Christmas! I screamed at the top of my lungs. The neighbor kids just down the street heard me. Merry Christmas! They hollered one after another. Ho ho ho! Hee hee hee! I watched them kick hacky sacks at each other, laughing and enjoying themselves. I was so jealous. I wanted to be surrounded by other kids, playing and being childish. And when my brother at that moment started crying. My mother noticed my stillness. She walked over to me and took both my shoulders in hand. You know, do you want to go play with them? I can ask Cindy. She told me. I wiped away my tears with a huff. As I came to a decision, suddenly another voice joined us. Ho ho ho! It was deep and rough. Merry Christmas, little girl. I thought, Santa! And finally he'd arrived! My eyes searched everywhere for the source of the noise. A tall figure dressed in red and white walked towards us. I was so excited! Santa! I exclaimed. Did you bring it? Closer and closer he stepped. Smell of copper and booze filled the air. I brought it, all right. These were blind. My mother took me under the arms and lifted me up. I was confused as she stepped away from the Santa of Christmas. He, he had my presents. Go away! She screamed. Her voice was shaking. Now this scared me. My mother was never scared. Her voice was always clear. I looked at her. Her eyes were jittering around and clouds of breath stuttered out of her mouth. Mom. I questioned. She held out her hand towards him as if just her will would force him away. You need to leave here, now! I glanced at Santa still walking towards us, but I noticed some new things about him. 
As he came into the luminance of our porch light, his limp became obvious, as well as the blood on his clothes. His dark, scraggly beard, gaunt cheeks, and wild eyes, my little heart beat so fast I could hear it in my ears. I'm only here to bring cheer, the man said, and then chuckled to himself. It was slow, deep. Shivers tingled up and down my spine. He was only ten feet away. He was taller than my mother by three heads. I noticed his teeth, which were black and brown. He came closer and then stopped. My mother held her breath. I was too young to understand. This standoff meant he intended to hurt us, but I was old enough to be terrified. My mother ran. He followed. I had to have been heavy because she was wheezing with effort. She just needed to get inside our little house and we'd be safe. I screamed. My mother fell forward, turning her body so that she wouldn't land on top of me. Santa had a hold of her ankle. Still, her priority was saving me. She threw me off of her towards the house. I landed about a foot away, and when I sat up, she was telling me what to do. Run! Get inside the house now! She bellowed. I stood up. Santa began struggling with her clothes, trying to pull her towards him so that he could do whatever it was he intended. Get inside! Call 911! She ordered. 911! Go! Just then, Santa punched my mother in the face. Once. Twice. She stopped moving. Blood dripping out of her nose and eyebrows. I backed away, unable to make any noise or make a decision. He lifted himself off of her and looked up at me with a crooked smile. That same chuckle from before rolled over his beard. I panicked and ran towards the house. Of course, he was much faster than me. He cut off the path between me and the door. I began breathing quickly. What are you going to do now, little girl? He laughed. I looked towards the kids from before and noticed they were all looking in our direction. I ran towards them as fast as I could. I only knew Cindy. She always brought my mother food when she was working too late to cook me dinner. It was her husband that ran towards me, however, urging me to run faster. He hurt mom! Help! I begged. The man's irregular stomps were getting closer behind me, and I could feel snow hitting the back of my legs. Cindy's husband was only a few feet away. I ran right up to him, expecting him to lift me up, but instead, he shoved me into a snowbank. My face was cold. Wet. I stood up as fast as I could in my panic. Cindy's husband was fighting with this Santa, but despite him being much bigger, Santa was winning. As they fought, my mother woke up and was running towards me. I only noticed her when she started kicking Santa as hard as she could. It had almost no effect on him. She shoved, she pulled, she hit him. He didn't react at all. Cindy was screaming at the entrance of her home. Call the cops! Go! She must have been talking to her kids. Santa wrapped his hands around her husband's neck. I wanted to help, so I ran over and I hit Santa too. My little fist pounded at his fur outfit and tore at his hair. His hat fell into the snow as I wailed, and I noticed that he barely had any hair. Nothing happened. My mother tried desperately to pull him off. Stop it! Don't hurt him! She begged. But Santa ignored her all the same. Cindy's husband passed out. Santa released his neck and then pulled something out of his coat. I watched as he punched that poor man in the gut over and over again. My mother fell backwards. She stared in horror because she'd seen what I couldn't conceptualize at such a young age. Blood poured over into the snow, causing steam to rise. My mother covered her mouth then grabbed me. It hurt how tightly she gripped my arm and swung me over her shoulder. As she ran, I watched Santa finish stabbing Cindy's husband and look over at us. It was dark. Now that I'm older, I think maybe he was actually watching Cindy because he walked towards their house and began kicking at their door. My mother threw me into our house. I landed on my back as she slammed the door shut and locked it. Her hair was wild and The white Christmas sweater she'd been wearing was stained with blood. She didn't even look at me. Sweetie, call 911, okay? 911, you can use the phone. Please just do it, she told me. Although she was trying to be calm, her voice was rough. She ran into the kitchen and locked the back door, then she locked every window in the house. I told the operator that Santa was hurting people. I told him our address. He told me to stay on the line, and so that's what I did. The long, coiled cord made it easy for me to watch my mother. What's all that noise? He asked me at some point. Mom's putting all of our furniture in front of the windows, I replied. She dragged our beds, bookcases, entertainment center, even the refrigerator into any room of the window. Suddenly, she stopped. Stomach-flipping screams came from outside, in the direction of Cindy's house. 
Mom walked over to the only window she'd left partially uncovered. Her hand covered her mouth. She, she took the phone from me. He's killing them. Send someone, please. She screamed into the receiver. I heard the man respond on the other end, but the screaming stopped. My mother dropped the phone, grabbed onto me, and held me in her arms. This was a mistake. We lived in the country, too far away from anyone else. It took the police hours to arrive at our house. Sometimes I wonder if maybe my mother had stayed on the phone, would, would they have arrived faster? After Santa was done with Cindy's family, he began kicking at our door. My mother, being a single woman, had reinforced those doors the second my father left. It saved our lives. He broke the windows, tapped on the exterior of our home, and beat his fists against the furniture my mother had moved. My mother prayed and sobbed. To this day, I still feel guilt for peeing in her lap. I was so scared. Santa wasn't supposed to hurt people. He was supposed to make them happy. Even the sound of the police sirens couldn't deter our pursuer. He began ramming his body against the door, anything to get to us. And when the police approached him, he didn't stop. Even as they tased him, he continued. Now that I'm older, I know the sounds I heard that night were... Gunshot. I'd heard them before, in the distance, as someone shot a raccoon or some other small animal, but never this close. I covered my ears. The man who attacked us was named Charles Stricker. My neighbors weren't his only victims that night, just... just his last. He was a drunk and addicted to multiple substances. He'd come home that evening high off his rocker and drunk. His wife kicked him out and told him, Don't come back until you've sobered up. And he came across our little neighborhood full of happy families and little kids playing in the snow. I guess... I guess he snapped. He killed seven people that night. Cindy, her husband, Stephen, and their son Peter. He also killed a sleeping family of four, one of our other neighbors. I guess they didn't feel the need to lock their doors that night. Demetrius and Cynthia, their twin babies. Henrietta and Fatima. They were only two years old. To this day, my mother won't talk about that night. She doesn't put up lights or a Christmas tree. She doesn't tell people happy holidays. Or even get on social media for a whole month. One of my neighbors did survive the attack, Cindy's youngest son, Harvey. I speak to him every now and again, but sometimes... Sometimes he doesn't answer my calls. I heard it's because he keeps trying to remove himself from the world, and each time... Each time he ends up in a behavioral ward. I don't send him or my mother Christmas cards. As for me, whenever it's this time of year, I avoid the mall. Seeing someone dressed up like Santa sends me into panic attacks. I black out and start screaming in public. Santa's hurting them. Please help us. He's going to kill them. It's quite embarrassing. I also have trouble living alone. I start to swirl deeper and deeper into a paranoid frenzy once snow sticks to the ground. I barely go out in the cold anymore and I can't live in the country. Lock your doors. The following is a set of instructions on how to perform the snowman ritual. This is a peace and prosperity ritual to be performed during the winter months in order to obtain favor and protection throughout the coming year, and will take three days to complete fully. The earliest written accounts of this ritual date back to the 4th century CE in Greater Scythia, now Ukraine and southernmost Russia. This translation has adapted the original materials used and the wording of the incantations to be more accessible for modern societies. Despite these changes, 
Recent attempts suggest that the correctly performed ritual is still very effective. Tradition dictates that this ritual be performed in the days between Christmas Eve, or the winter solstice, and New Year's Day, but in theory, it should be effective during any cold period where there is sufficient snowfall. This ritual works best for farmers and homeowners who keep livestock or pets. Urban apartment dwellers can attempt it, but will have a much harder time ensuring that the ritual is not interrupted or disturbed during the three-day duration. Warning, for your own safety, please read the entire document before attempting the ritual. You will need snow coverage of at least three inches with temperatures near or below freezing over the three-day period, two tree branches or wooden sticks, preferably forked at one end, string or rubber bands, plant material such as dead leaves or dried grass, vegetable oil such as canola or olive oil, animal material such as a strip of leather, clump of fur, cluster of feathers, etc. Animal blood, such as cow or pig's blood, this can be purchased at your local butcher shop or supermarket. Scissors, a sterilized needle, a lock of your hair, a drop of your blood. Instructions, at the edge of your property, build a snowman. It must be at least as tall as you are, so be sure to set aside the time and energy necessary, or enlist family members to help you. Ensure that the front of the snowman is facing away from your house. Use the tree branches on either side to form the snowman's arms, but do not give it a face. That will come later. At sundown, take the plant material, the vegetable oil, and the string or rubber bands out of the snowman. Facing the snowman, you should be looking at your house over its shoulder. Secure the plant materials to its left hand, your right hand, with the string or rubber bands. Dip your fingers into the vegetable oil and press the finger into the left side of its face, your right side. This is the snowman's left eye. As you do this, recite the following. Snowman, snowman, see my lamb, hollowed soil on which we stand. Snowman, snowman, bless my home, guide me back if I ever roam. Afterwards, return to your house, lock the doors, draw the curtains, and go to bed before midnight. If you wake in the night and hear a shuffling noise in the snow, do not open your curtains. The snowman is moving about, judging if your land and home are worthy. If you wake in the morning and the snowman has returned to its original position, congratulations. Your land and home will be safe for the next year, and you will be sure to return from any long journey you take. If you wake in the morning and the snowman is on a different part of your land, take heed of it. Whatever it is near will be affected by some calamity within the following year. If you wake in the morning and the snow is not melted, but the snowman is gone, move. The next day at sundown, take the animal material, the animal blood, and the string or rubber bands out of the snowman. Facing the snowman, you should be looking at your house over its shoulder, secure the animal materials to its right hand, your left hand, with the string or rubber bands. Dip your finger in the blood and press the finger into its right side of the face, your left side. That's the snowman's right eye. As you do this, recite the following. Snowman, snowman, see my herd, pet and cattle, fish and bird. Snowman, snowman, bless my flock, grow them grass from thorn and rock. Afterwards, return to your house, lock the door, and draw the curtains, and go to bed before midnight. If you wake in the night and hear a shuffling noise in your house, do not open your bedroom door. The snowman is moving about, judging if the animals in your care are worthy. If you wake in the morning and the snowman has returned to its original position, congratulations. Your pets will be healthy for the next year, and any livestock you own will thrive. If you wake in the morning and there is an inexplicable puddle of water near something your pet owns, like your dog's bed or your bird's cage, take heed of it. You should probably look into pet insurance for the next year. If you wake in the morning and the snow is not melted, but the snowman is gone, say goodbye to them while you can. I'm so, so sorry. The next day at sundown, take the scissors and the needle out to the snowman. Facing the snowman, you should be looking at your house over its shoulder. Use the needle to draw a drop of blood from your fingertip and draw it in a straight line across the snowman's face, forming a groove in the snow. This is the snowman's mouth. Using the scissors, clip a lock of your hair and stuff it into the groove in its mouth, ensuring the hair does not fall out. And as you do this, recite the following. Snowman, snowman, see my breath, drawing ever unto death. Snowman, snowman, bless my heart, judge me whole and hence depart. 
Afterwards, return to your house, lock the door, draw the curtains, and go to bed before midnight. If you wake in the night and feel a cold, dark presence in your room, do not open your eyes. The snowman is standing over you, judging if your soul is worthy. If you wake in the morning, congratulations. The snowman will have returned to its original position, having judged you worthy. You can expect good health and good fortune in the following year. Warning. To date, there are no surviving accounts of what happens to someone who is judged as unworthy. Take from that what you will. The next day before sunset, preferably when the sun is highest, go over to the snowman. Approach it only from behind. Do not walk around to face it. Demolish the snowman completely. Break the tree branches as many times as possible. Scatter the snow around the yard as evenly as you can. Make sure that no trace of it remains. Say absolutely nothing. Once the snowman is demolished, the ritual is complete. Enjoy your year of peace and prosperity. Use it well, for when the days grow short and your luck runs thin, you may find yourself looking anxiously for the next deep snowfall. If so, I pray that the snowman may judge you whole, this year and every year after. I had my hands full with a rat's nest of tangled Christmas lights when the receptionist Katie poked her head into the garage. Circle up boys, it's time to draw straws. It's a little late in the season for the Dumonts, I said. My team stopped their work, setting down storage totes and giant plastic candy canes, and came to crowd around a little coffee bar I built in our garage bay. Katie held up a cup full of wooden stirring sticks. Come on, don't be shy. She went around her group, all bundled up in paint-spattered workwear, letting each employee take one. Marco sucked his teeth. Looks like I'm on the naughty list this year. Chris, the first official victim of Dumont House, elbowed Marco in his ribs. Nice knowing you, bud. A year after Chris's concussion, another employee broke his back at the very same property. We've been pulling straws for jobs over there ever since. It should be too. Who else has it? Katie asked. That'd be me. I held up my stick, marked with a black tally. Every year I took part in the Dumont drawings as a show of faith to my staff, but this was the first time I'd actually go out onto the job. Hey boss, if you don't make it, I'll take great care of the place, I promise. As Chris flashed a wide smile. Alright, smartass. You can finish untangling while I'm gone. I'd motioned back at the mess of wires and bulbs I've been wrangling. I've entertained enough of your superstition for today. Admittedly, I did feel a bit uneasy heading over to the job. Roofers aren't exactly known for believing in luck and curses, but the boys certainly had a reason to be wary. Most visits to the Dumont house involved at least one close call. If I were there, if there was even a scrap of evidence the job site was unsafe, I would have ditched the client. Even Chris told me he long suspected the fear around the house was self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course, that didn't explain everything. I heard it happened in 1929. Marco broke the silence from his passenger seat. The owner lost everything in a crash. Bank was foreclosing. The poor bastard decided to hang himself from the banister to tank it to resale value. Family found him swinging there on a Christmas morning. Is that the version going around these days? I asked. Why? What did you hear? I bit my lip. I knew I shouldn't indulge. But... I heard it was an accident, back in the 70s. Didn't feel quite right to decorate while their kid was over in Saigon. But when he shipped back last minute, they rushed to decorate the whole place in one night. The dad slipped off the roof and he broke his neck. That was real tragedy. I don't know, me personally. If I fell off the roof on accident, I wouldn't want to hang around, honing the place forever. Specifically if that was the job site, no offense. Yeah, none taken. I'd hope you could find something better to do with your afterlife. I turned into the horseshoe driveway and pulled in front of the old Victorian. The house wasn't huge, so much as tall. A turret rose above the wraparound porch from the left side, easily stretching three or four stories before coming to a point. Hey man, you think we'll need to get a bigger ladder for that? Marco asked. Yeah, no doubt, probably. 
He grinned. This is going to look amazing. I'm glad I got you all in the Christmas spirit. I grabbed the clipboard propped against the center console and hopped out of the truck. Marco beat me to the bed and was already unloading our equipment. I'll get us to set up out here, boss. You go take care of the easy stuff inside. He cracked a smile. The doorbell sounded like something an old cathedral would use to call the town mass on Sunday morning. I almost felt bad for disturbing the ancient looking man that eventually answered it. He looked as though he'd been tall once, but shrank with age. I could count the wispy white hairs that remained atop his head. Are you Mr. Dumont? I asked. Yes. He spoke with a soft voice that still had some strength to it. I'm Chuck from Pinner Painters and Holiday Decorating. He still seemed confused. You called to hire us to do your Christmas lights, right? A look of recognition crept across his face. Oh, oh, okay, how lovely. This is what I was thinking. I held out a clipboard, but the sketches of what I planned out are back at the shop. It's pretty similar to what we did last year. I, I thought it would be nice to warm things up a bit with some color. He squinted at the page, nodding in a silent agreement. As a smile lit up his face, he handed it back to me. It's beautiful, but you can leave the top alone. He tapped the clipboard with his bony finger. That's so high up, I wouldn't want you boys to hurt yourselves. Oh, nonsense. Did he know about the rumors too? It's no trouble at all. That was a lie. But leaving the upper floor of the house unlit would make the whole thing look sloppy. I wasn't putting my name on something like that. We'll get started right away, sir. The man caught my wrist as I turned back to the porch. Just be careful out there, all right? Of course, sir. Thank you. I made it two steps out of the front door before Marco called me. Hey, Chuck. It sounded like he was around the side of the house. Yeah? I started walking around the porch. The wood felt spongy beneath my boots. Hey, bring the A-frame ladder, would you? What for? Just come. I didn't have to look far. The ladder had been popped open and set up right beside the edge of the porch. I leaned out from beneath the awning to grab it. Whoa, Chuck, what are you doing? It was Marco, and he was above me. Aren't you? I stopped mid-sentence to poke my head around the side of the building. The side yard was empty, save for creeping woods. I stepped out from under the porch and spotted Marco, sitting with his legs dangling over the edge of the roof. What are you doing up there? You told me to go up and look for the place where we could hide the wires. He pointed up at the turret. You know, you pulled that ladder about half a second before I stepped down on it. It could have killed me. I'm sorry, I, I, I thought you were calling me from around the back of the house. Marco didn't answer. He just shot me this confused look, like he wasn't sure if I was messing with him. Had we both been hearing things? Hey man, just come down and we'll get started, I said. We put the incident out of mind while we laid out our materials. But the second we set up the tall ladder, I got the nagging feeling something wasn't quite right. We planted the base out in the yard and carefully lowered the rubber grip of the feet against the siding at the top of the turret. You sure you don't want to do this bit first? Marco asked. Absolutely. Knock out the tricky stuff while we're still fresh. You know, there's more daylight. I reasoned. Before the ghost knows we're here. Marco cocked an eyebrow. Oh, knock it off. If you're so brave, why don't you go up there? He held out the green wire, lined with large, bright colored bulbs. I snatched the cord from his hand. You better hold the ladder tight, you big baby. With everything wrong I claimed, my confidence shrank a little. The ladder seemed to bounce in time with my steps, flexing under my weight over the long span. Of course, I knew this was normal, but I lost count of the number of homes I painted. Why did this feel so different? Halfway to the top, my hands began to shake from anticipation. I was actually expecting something terrible to happen. I wiped my sweaty palms on my work jacket and pressed upward. Near the top of the turret, I passed the home's highest window. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a movement in the gap between the curtains. Dumont was probably taking a peek at our progress. I ignored the window and set to work. We'd already attached plastic clips to each bulb. Back in the shop, all I had to do was pop them onto the edge of the roof. Three, four, five. I counted off under my breath. It didn't take long to reach as far as I could in either direction. With the size of the turret, we'd probably need to reposition a handle of times. 
This would be time consuming. Over the top of the gutter, there was a small lift with a gradual slope before the roof angled sharply upward. If I looped a long safety harness around the spire, I could walk my way around and fix all of the lights in only a minute or two. The ladder jerked backward, putting me several feet away from the safety of the roof. I clung to the rails, swore, and leaned my body weight forward. My position didn't change. The ladder slowly moved farther away from the building. Marco! My voice shook with fear. I didn't want to look down, but I could feel my center of gravity getting close to the point of no return. When the ladder stood vertical, the fall would be inevitable. Oh shit, hang on. Marco's voice called out. But why did it sound so far away? I chanced a glance at the ground and saw my assistant sprinting back toward me from the truck. Was he out of his mind? He left the ladder unattended. He was fired, no question about it. I would fire him for this, if I survived. The top of the ladder jumped back toward the building, almost shaking me loose in the process. I was still out in the open air. As I pulled myself against the bars, my gaze fell on the ground once more. There was another man below me, digging in his heels as he tried to pull the ladder back toward the house. I knew right away this wasn't Marco. The man wore blue coveralls and a dandelion yellow ball cap, stained with flecks of paint. I've got you. Don't move. As soon as Marco took hold of the side rails, the stranger started to climb up the underside, adding his weight to mine and pulling me closer to the house. I swung within the range of the dangling strands of lights. I reached out, wrapped the cord around my wrist, and started to tug. The extra pull seemed to be just what we needed. The gutters inched closer. Plastic snapped as one, two, three clips broke free. I wrestled with the wires and I tugged again, closer. Another clip popped off. Help! Marco yelled. Was he losing his grip? I was so close to the side of the house and the window. Was that open before? Hey Chuck, I'm slipping. Getting down alive could mean doing something risky. Marco, hold the left side. I let go of the lights and I shuffled toward the window. I lifted my foot off the rung and extended my leg, touching the seal with the tip of my toe. I could make it. I shuffled farther, reaching my left hand off the ladder and grabbing the upper edge of the window frame. Almost. My second foot couldn't reach the window, not while I was still held onto the ladder. I gritted my teeth and I let go of the rung. The rooted wood gave a little. My hand scrambled for something sturdier to grab, settling on the curtain rod. Once my fingers wrapped around the wood, I pulled myself into the room. Without my weight, the ladder sprang away from the siding, toppled backwards, and came crashing down, right through the truck's front windshield. Chuck! I stuck my head out the window. I'm fine. The hell was so important you needed to go back to the truck? You told me you anchored in and sent me back to the truck for the bulbs. No, I didn't. He looked up at me with genuine confusion. I... but I heard you. Was he for real? I thought back to the voice that I heard from the side yard. He must have been hearing things again. And this time, it had almost gotten me killed. Where'd the other guy go? I asked. Who? Again, real confusion. Hang on. I'll be right down. The musty room smelled like it hadn't been aired out in decades. I could practically taste the cigarette smoke and the curtains, the wallpaper, and the linens hanging from the ornate slay-style bed all bore pale brown nicotine stains and everything. Dust coated every surface, rising from the carpet with every step that I took toward the door. The handle turned, but it wouldn't budge. I returned to the window and called back down to Marco. Hey man, it feels like something is blocking the door. Can you get up here, please? It wound up taking him five minutes just to convince the widower to let him up to the fourth floor and twice as long to let Marco remove the boarded up barricade that was keeping me inside the old bedroom. What about rope? Tied to the bed, maybe, and lower yourself down. He suggested through the door. Please just don't make me open it. It took us threatening that man to call the police to get him to cave and the longer I stayed in the room, the more I understood why. The pool of sunlight filtering through the window shifted, revealing a dark stain on the carpet. The pointed corner of the dresser bore a similar mark, though it was much harder to make out on the dark mahogany. My mind raced. Could that be blood? 
It was either that or wine. Judging by the boards on the door, I guess there was a good chance someone really had died in the room. When the door finally opened, I pushed past Dumont, grabbed Marco by the front of his jacket, and pulled his face within inches of mine. I should shove you out of that window, you have wit. You don't just leave someone like that. Chuck, you sent me back to the truck. I thought you were safe. You could have used your eyes if it hadn't been for the other guy. What other guy? Dumont pushed us apart with a degree of strength that didn't match his frail frame. This isn't his fault. It's mine. Mine and Mary's. He led us down the hall to a black and white wedding photograph. Didn't take much imagination to see that this man was a younger Dumont. The woman could have been a movie star. She had a gorgeous heart-shaped face framed by long curly hair. That's Mary, Dumont said. She's always a pretty girl. Always told so, and well, that can do things to a young lady's head. Do you know what I mean? Do I ever, Marco muttered. I just nodded. Mary fancied herself the center of attention. Always assumed people were looking at her, even when maybe they weren't. I knew plenty about that, but I bit my tongue. Billy was a family friend, a roofer, and he came by to fix a leak up in the turret. I guess Mary forgot or didn't know she was changing. Must have seen Billy through the curtains and got startled. He trailed off in motion back to the room. She bled out before we went to get help. Now I understand her reluctance to open the door. Sir, I'm sorry. It was a lifetime ago. He let out a labored sigh. I'm certain Billy wasn't leering or anything like that, but I can say the same for Mary. She always had a vengeful streak. I don't follow. Billy came back to finish the job for free. He wouldn't take my money and wouldn't hear anything else. His way of showing how sorry he was, I suppose. I left to grab these guys lunch and when I got back, he swallowed hard. I'll never forget how Billy looked, laying on the pavement. Men on the ground swore they saw someone lean out the window and push him. I thought back to the man on the ladder. I don't suppose Billy was wearing a yellow cap and overalls when he died, was he? Dumont's eyes widened. How'd you know? I think he just saved my life. I refused the man's money and politely explained that we could no longer service his home. Yes, I expected as much. There was a resigned kind of sadness in his voice when, when we left him in the foyer. We loaded up our gear before heading to the property line to wait for our tow. Neither of us wanted to stand any closer to that house than we had to. When the truck finally arrived, I looked back up at the window one last time. The sash was still up, leaving the smoke-stained curtains free to dance in the December breeze. Someone was standing there, staring down at me. A woman with golden hair, stained black on one side and matted against her head. I blinked. The window was closed, and she was gone. It was the Christmas of 1965, before man had landed on the moon, before the wall had fallen, before many things good and bad. For me, it was the last time that I knew innocence, before the creeping shadow which engulfed my family, before the madness, before death, before. It was the advent calendar, that thing which I had to have. Each door a promise of Christmas, and each window a misted reminder of the warmth and kindness of the festive season. I was nine years old, and while the parents in my neighborhood would have had no fears for their children in the past, allowing them to play freely in the icy December streets, those days were lost like breath on a mirror. If snow had fallen, there would have been no joy. No snowball fights in the darkened evenings. No sledges sliding carefree down the fields nearby. Children could not be children. Though the young may have felt apprehension in the dark, it was the parents who were the most fearful, terrified of the ultimate loss, a pain they could never extinguish. 
For the previous three Christmases, without fail, the worst had happened. A child had gone missing. While I was very young, I remember it all as though it were yesterday. The suburb where we lived had become the most somber of places. Such a tragedy can do that, slowly draining away any hope or happiness from a community like blood from an open wound. No Christmas tree nor carol sang could stem the flow. The first to disappear was Tommy Graham. He was 11 years old, and although I had seen him around, I didn't really know him personally. I remember my mother crying about it. Just the thought of something terrible happening to a child distressed her greatly, and the pain that the parents must have been going through was often on her lips. That Christmas, my dad held on to me tighter than he had ever done before, and I could tell that they were affected terribly by the disappearance, just as the rest of the community had been. The following year, another Christmas came, and another child was taken. Her name was Cheryl, and she was only four years old, tiny and fragile. Tears were shed. Misplaced rage vented towards the police who were unable to find her, and by New Year it was the commonly held view that, like Tommy, the year before, little Cheryl would never be found. I, like many of my friends, had been scared by the vanishing children. It was the first time that I became aware that adults could do harm, even to the most vulnerable of us, that children were not always safe, and that those bigger and stronger than us could have unspeakable things on their minds. Yes, I had heard the fairy tales and the frightening stories of the peed piper and the boogeyman, but what was going on in our suburb was far more gut-wrenching far more real than any tall tale. Despite this impact, it was not until the third child disappeared that I was truly heartbroken. His name was Finn, and he was one of my friends, a close one at that. We lived on the same street, playing football in a field by his house, and walking to and from school together each day. My dad used to take us to the cinema most Sundays buying us each a hot dog, and when we got home, Mom would serve us a beautiful Sunday roast. Finn was like part of the family, and I still think about him to this day. Where would he have been now? What would he have done with his life? How diminished have we been, not knowing that boy or the adult he would have become? No laughs. No tears together. Just an empty seat at the cinema a vacant desk in the classroom. I remember his blue eyes and blonde hair more than anything else for some reason. That and his happy-go-lucky nature. I missed him then, and even now I wish that it were not true. Like the others, Finn had been snatched from his bed as he slept on that most peaceful of nights. Christmas Eve. His parents had tucked him in hanging his stocking over the fireplace, kissing his forehead, whispering a Merry Christmas as he fell asleep. They woke, expecting to hear the excited scampering footsteps of their son rushing down the stairs to see what Santa had brought, what wrapped secret boxes he had left by the tree, and instead were confronted with an empty bed, the loss of their only child, and an open window sucking in the biting frost of Christmas Day. The parents of all three children would not let go, could not, nor would they assume the worst. Search parties were organized. Flyers were continually posted through letterboxes, pasted onto bulletin boards and shop windows across the city, and the hope was always there that somehow, somewhere, the three children would be found, unharmed, and ready to come home. That year, on the 28th of November, 1965, all hope was extinguished. In an old sewage pipe across town, the crumpled, fragile bodies of Tommy, Cheryl, and dear Finn were found, 
stuffed unceremoniously into a corroded pipe in an old sewer, rotting in the waters below. The pain was palpable, the families inconsolable, and for all of us who knew any of the victims, it was to be a bleak and shadow-ridden Christmas. Three days later, the month turned. Eyes moved towards Christmas, and the shaking fear that something cruel and callous lived amongst us all. Three children in three years. Now, into the fourth. What would happen that Christmas Eve? Which family would be broken? Which child torn from its comfy, warm bed, dreaming of Santa, only to be killed and discarded like a piece of fetid waste? My parents were nervous, and who could blame them? I sensed the change in atmosphere around the streets where I usually played. Families pulling their children in earlier and earlier before the dark came. At night, on more than one occasion, I heard hampering echoing from an unseen source. No doubt windows being nailed shut to prevent any more children being snatched as they slept. On the 1st of December, my dad hung our Christmas lights outside along the gutter of our roof. Little beads of glowing color piercing through each cold winter night. We tried to continue on as normal and think of happier times. As always, he asked me to help. You're my wingman, kiddo, he'd say from behind his bright red scarf, clambering up a set of wooden ladders to the roof above. He had flown for the Air Force before I was born, and still used the lexicon of those days in the military. But I didn't mind. It made me feel special. In previous years, I had been too small, too young to be of any real use in decorating the outside of our home. But my dad always included me. I think he just liked to do things with me, to have some father-son time. Standing at the bottom of the ladders, looking up at him, whistling Christmas songs out loud, made me feel part of the accomplishment, part of the yearly celebrations. That December was different, however. It was the first time I was big enough to go up the ladders with him, to look out at the old street below and see the occasional blink from a weathered set of lights clinging to a neighbor's fence or home. My mom was terrified. She had visions of us both falling to our death, but my dad always seemed sure of himself. Not arrogant, just confident and cheerfully reminding us all that things would be okay. Looking back, I think that's what I loved about him the most when I was a kid. The fact that he had it all in hand and did everything to reassure his family and friends. I never felt in danger up on those ladders. Always loved, always safe, always. Before we came down, I remember looking at the rooftops poking out in regimented lines from the streets around. I noticed that the world seemed different from up there, and that to me, there appeared to be fewer Christmas lights than ever before. That night, I knew what was coming. My mom tucked me into my bed as my dad finished hanging some paper ring decorations from my bedroom ceiling. I always felt that those decorations protected me somehow. I would stir in the night, scared of the dark, and yet at Christmas time, I believed that somehow those pieces of colored paper, that blinking Christmas tree in the other room, that those symbols, those pieces of goodwill would keep whatever monstrosities hid in the dark at bay. My mom kissed me on the forehead and left the room, and there was my dad standing in the corner with his hands behind his back, smiling. Well, wingman, you know what time it is, he said as we both began to chuckle. Let me see, dad, please, I yelled, excited. From behind his back, he produced an advent calendar. I leapt for joy across the room and hugged him before snatching it from his hands and diving back under the covers. Sitting down on the bed, Dad ruffled my hair with his fingers, watching me curiously. He knew I loved getting an advent calendar each Christmas, and I had worried that I wouldn't get one this year, 
as he had told me that most of the shops were sold out of them. But dad being dad, he had spent hours driving around until he found one and made sure that on the night of December the 1st, the first night of the advent, there it was. The calendar was beautiful, handmade with carefully crafted drawings on its front and back. The lines and sketched colors lovingly showed a Christmas street full of lights, with houses covered in snow, and the windows beaming with a warm yellow glow, waiting for the night Santa would arrive. What I loved about each year's advent calendar, the good ones at least, was that they told a story. They showed something wonderful happening. Each door or window would be opened night upon night, revealing a picture, building until that magical climax of Christmas. I loved the anticipation of the holidays, and the advent calendar symbolized the hopes that Christmas held. Not just presents, although as a child that was a big part of it, but spending time with my family, seeing my grandparents who usually lived in another part of the country, and getting to eat all the chocolates and turkey I could cram into my mouth, getting to be away from the boredom of school, getting to play with new toys, getting to have fun with my friends. It was the thought of friends which brought me down for a moment. There I was holding an advent calendar, each cardboard door numbered from 1 to 24, from the 1st of December until Christmas Eve the same night that one year previous, my dear friend Finn had been taken, murdered, and left to rot down a sewer. I began to cry, and almost instinctively my dad seemed to know what was upsetting me. He asked about Finn, and when he mentioned his name I sobbed deeper than I had since his death. My poor friend who would never again go on those carefree days out with me and dad or walk alongside me to school, laughing and playing. It was then that my father explained to me something about death, words which have always stayed with me. You know something, kiddo? As long as you keep the memory of the people you've lost in your mind and in your heart, they'll always be alive. They'll always be with you, so Finn is right here, he said, pointing to my chest gently. With those words, I felt a soothing comfort wash over me, and all cried out, my dad tucked me into bed, kissed me on the head and said goodnight, knowing to leave my bedroom door open slightly, to let some light from the hall keep my room from the dark. He had left the advent calendar sitting nearby, its closed windows facing me from my nightstand, and yet I was exhausted and so my thoughts drifted from what lay behind those cardboard doors to sleep, and hopefully to a more rested state of mind. But that did not occur. I woke in the night from a horrendous dream about my friend Finn, little four-year-old Cheryl, and eleven-year-old Tommy Graham, crushed down a sewer pipe, the water running over their bodies into their mouths, which once spoke and laughed and smiled, only then to be rendered silent by an unseen, brutal hand. In the darkness, Finn's voice cried out, garbled and drowned. A word came forth and clung to me like no other. Run. I leapt out from my bed, soaked in sweat, ready to cry out for my mom and dad, but then something strange caught my attention, shaking me to the core. I looked to the advent calendar, to the drawings of cozy houses covered in snow, their windows beaming out into the cold December night, sitting there waiting almost as I had left it. Yet something was amiss, something which I had no memory of. The first advent door had been opened. The cardboard left ajar like the one to my room. Stepping forward, the sweat dripped from my hand as I pulled the door back to reveal what secrets the calendar had in store for me. In what little light there was, I squinted, my mind slowly piecing together the picture behind door number one. As my eyes adjusted, I recoiled in horror at the sight and screamed for my family. Within seconds, the light was on and my dad appeared, picking me up, consoling me as he put me back into bed. 
I pointed feverishly over to the calendar, telling him that something awful hid behind the door. Of course, he looked, then smiled reassuringly. It's just a happy Christmas scene, kiddo, he said, handing it to me. Looking closely, I could see that the picture had changed slightly. It depicted an old stone bridge covered in snow. Children played on top of it happily. Yes, it appeared quite harmless, quite serene. My father left and soon I was drifting back to sleep. Yet my mind hazed over with two thoughts. A Finn screaming run in my dream and what I could have sworn I had seen in that first little calendar door. The bridge was there, but underneath in the dark, eyes looked out to the children playing gleefully above. Eyes which seemed racked with rage and hate. The next day at school went quickly, but on my way home I dragged my feet over the bitter frozen concrete paths and pavements, thinking of Finn and how he had always walked with me. As my house came into view, I smiled for a moment at the lights Dad and I had hung on the roof. They warmed my spirits. But when I entered my room, my soul was chilled stagnant once more. The next advent calendar door had been opened. This time I knew. I had not been there to do such a thing in my sleep, as I had assumed must have happened the night before. No. Someone had opened it. I touched the yellow number two of the cardboard door, a number which should have promised a treat or happy picture, reminding me that Christmas was near. I hesitated and then looked behind it. Another street scene played out before me. This time a small boy pulled a red sled behind him as the other children threw snowballs at each other, grinning wide and happy. At first I sighed with relief that the picture had no hidden intruder, no eyes staring out in the darkness in contempt, but just as I sat the calendar back down onto my nightstand, I saw it, the faint outline of a person looking out towards me, almost invisible, yet hiding within that Christmas scene in plain view, sitting there on the boy's red sled. I closed my eyes and rubbed them fearful as they might reaffirm the figure's presence once more when opened. But just as the darkened eyes had disappeared from under the bridge on the 1st of December, the faint outline of the unseen pretender had moved on from the picture. I knew that no one would believe me, and even worse, I barely believed it myself. My nine-year-old mind could not comprehend such strange and ominous occurrences. Yet I was not so removed from the idea of horrid things scuttling around in the dark. Creatures which even parents could not protect you from. The figure had moved on. I was certain of it. And I knew that it must have traveled and hid behind the door for the 3rd of December. The next morning I told myself that I would not open any of the closed doors from the advent calendar. I promised myself... Yet someone, something, was doing it for me. That night I awoke in the darkness once more, the same dream playing out. Poor Finn muffled and drowned by the putrid sewage water, crying out in the dark. Crying out, and yet warning, pleading. Run, he said. Run. Again I leapt from my bed, and once more the calendar door for that day had been opened by an unseen force. There in the dark I looked, compelled by the fear of not looking, the terror of not knowing what was to come. For in that third picture it became clear to me. Something was on its way. Something unspeakable was plotting and slowly but surely drawing closer. Behind that door lay another Christmas scene, families skating on a beautiful iced lake, and under that transparent barrier between the cold air and the icy water, there was a shape, darkened, indefinite, but malevolent, a blurred form under the ice, eyes staring up in disgust at the families who happily skated above. I screamed again, 
and yet the results were all too familiar. My mom and dad arrived, tired, yet never annoyed at their child for waking them in the night. Mom put me back into bed, and as she did so, I explained frantically to them both that something was appearing in the advent calendar, that each door held proof of something which meant to do me harm, yet there was no evidence of it, only three open doors showing happiness and fun at Christmas. Dad said I was having bad dreams, and that he and Mom would sit with me for a while until I fell asleep. I heard them whispering about work in the morning, but they were more concerned about me than losing a few hours of rest. The next day, again, I tried to ignore the advent calendar, tried desperately to avoid its doors, and again I failed. In the night, I awoke to the same hideous dream, and yet this time, the calendar was not open. The door with a yellow number four remained closed. I hoped that whatever strange thing was in those pictures had left, that I could forget the hateful haunting eyes, and that I could return to simply enjoying the anticipation of Christmas. But just as I nodded back to sleep, happier than I had been since they had first found Finn's body, I heard something, the sound of a thumb or finger pulling at cardboard. I opened my eyes and stared in utter disbelief as the fourth door was pulled open by an invisible hand in the dark. It is strange that I did not scream, but since then I have heard people say that when you are as scared as you can possibly be, that you cannot move, nor can you cry out for help. I opened my mouth and no noise came, a paralysis of fear which was overpowering. There I lay in the night, staring wide-eyed at the fourth door, wondering what disturbing depiction it would reveal, and even more so, terrified that whatever had opened it still lurked nearby. I wish I could say that it stopped, that the horrid revelation ceased, but I cannot. Some nights the dreams of Finn yelling at me to run came, but on others they did not. The only constant was that at some point, a calendar door would be opened, whether in the morning or at night. Each door would show a happy scene, and each time something hideous, which only I could see, would be momentarily present. One door showed a group of carolers cheerfully singing at night, warmed by the glow of an open window, and at the rear there stood an outline, something watching something waiting, something moving on relentlessly to Christmas Eve, the last door. Another picture showed a small girl, no older than poor Cheryl who had been killed, placing presents into a stocking, and yet for a moment there was the faintest impression of a hand reaching out from the stocking towards the girl. By the 20th, the horrific pictures had intensified as too had the dreams. Finn now screamed my name, his voice echoing up through a drain, pleading with me to get away. And as those nightly terrors revealed themselves, the pictures had taken on more weight, more immediacy, for I was certain that they now showed the street where I lived. My dad found me crying that night, and when he asked what was wrong, I told him, I believed that there was something evil coming, something horrendous which had snatched a child each of the previous three Christmas Eves, the same evil which had taken my friend, that hidden horror which on Christmas Eve would come for me. Dad reassured me that this was not the case, that I was imagining things. When he looked at the pictures on the calendar, he just saw nondescript streets anonymous faces, nothing which suggested the place where we lived. But I saw differently. The drawings clearly showed house by house, inch by inch, that something was drawing nearer each day, fleeting glimpses of a faint figure waiting to gorge itself once more. 
My dad offered to throw the advent calendar away if it was upsetting me so much, but I pleaded with him not to. I needed to know. I had to see what was coming, what was on its way to snatch me from my family as it had done to the other children. The 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of December were torturous. While I should have been excited for Christmas Day, I was not. I was terrified, for I knew that I would never live to see it. The calendar door on the 21st, opened by something unseen while I slept, showed a house come into view, one with glowing lights hung around the roof gutter, and the faint outline of something terrible approaching nearby. I was certain that the house was mine, and that the light which beamed outward into the snowy landscape was from my family. Though as I peered out into the night from my window, there was no snow in reality, just a biting wind and a frost which covered everything like a shroud. I could not see a figure out there, but I felt it, somewhere close, just waiting for Christmas Eve. On the 22nd, the figure drew closer to our home as the snow fell around it in the advent calendar. And on the 23rd, the prowler had reached the gate to our garden. That night, I had such a terrible vision. In my dream, I found myself lying in the dark. I could not see, and all that surrounded me was the empty coldness of winter. Pain coursed through my body, and the sound of running water pushed over it, forcing me deeper into an abandoned drain. Putting out my hand instinctively, my fingers touched the frozen mouth of another child. Slowly it moved against my hand, and its stagnant lips whispered as if weakened. Run. Run. Get away. I did not wake screaming, nor did I leap from my bed as I had the other nights like an animal fleeing from a predator. There I lay in the silence of the night, and in that stillness... I cried. The paper chains and decorations my family had hung from my room's ceiling proved no protection from the pain or from the thoughts of the three children, how they had been taken, and how I would be next. And then the day had come. Christmas Eve. I was frightened, but a distance took me one which slowed my words and left me dispassionate about the festive season, about my family. I wish I had not been that way and had savored every moment I had left, but I was drained, numbed by the lurking fear which had haunted me for weeks, tired of it all, a strain which no nine-year-old should have had to bear. My dad knew I wasn't my usual self as I normally relished Christmas Eve like most children, excited and completely enthused for what would come. But there I was outside in the cold, helping him fix part of the lights which had come unhooked in the wind. I watched my dad on the ladders once more, the wind rattling everything around, the slates on the roof, the trees, the gutter. I thought about how Finn's family, or little Cheryl's, or even Tommy Graham's, would have been preparing for Christmas Day like we were, happily unaware of the loss they were about to undergo. At least I knew. I had foresight. Each hideous picture hinting at that faint figure coming closer and closer to my home, to my open window as I slept waiting for Christmas morning, to snatch me from my bed to slaughter me, discarding my body down a sewer pipe, used and forgotten. As the wind howled and the lights chinked and jingled together, I looked back at the gate to our garden, to where I had last seen my future attacker. I could see nothing, just an empty street on the quietest night of the year, but in that absence I could feel eyes bearing into me. My dad climbed down the ladder whistling merrily to himself, and as I looked up at him I simply asked, matter-of-factly, if he would nail my window shut. 
He didn't ask why. He knew many parents had done the same. And so we went inside as the evening rolled in, carried by the promise of frost from the outskirts of the city. Dad got his toolbox out and drove a large series of nails into the frame of the window. Once I was confident that there was no way to open it, I thanked him and asked if he would do one more thing for me. Only one. To sit next to my bed all night and look over me until morning. Unlike the other nights, he did not tell me that there was no monstrosity out there, nor did he say that the world was a safe place, for that would have been a lie. He placed his hand gently on my shoulder and said, If you need me, I'll sit right here until it's time to open the presents. And sit there he did. My mother came in to kiss me on the head before returning back to the kitchen, where she was preparing things for dinner the next day. I so wanted to see it. Presence meant nothing to me by that night. All I cared about was being there at the family table, laughing with Gramps and Gran, and knowing that the nightmare of December 1965 was over. I fell asleep as my dad sat by the bed, reading his book. It must have been two or three in the morning when I woke. I was unsure of the precise time, but what I knew was that my dad was standing at my window, looking down, out to the street below. I whispered to him and asked what was wrong, but his reply was hesitant. Nah, nothing kiddo, go back to sleep. Then I heard it, certain and labored, the sound of footsteps slowly walking up our garden path outside, shambling forward towards our home. The sound frightened me, and my thoughts immediately turned to the advent calendar, to the faint outlined figure which had haunted me. From what little light there was, I could see that the door for Christmas Eve was sealed shut, yet to be opened. The footsteps continued, one after the other, slowly, steadily. My dad stared intently outside as I asked if he could see anyone out there, but he just shook his head in disbelief. The footsteps ceased, and silence covered everything like the frost outside. Suddenly, it was broken by three loud, booming knocks. It was at our door. I cried out in terror and started sobbing. It's come to take me, Dad, like Finn and the others. I howled in utter despair as the tears slid down my cheek. Nonsense. It must just be our neighbor or something, my dad said unconvincingly. No, Dad, it's here. It's here to take me away. I screamed as I handed the calendar to him. Open the last door. Open it and you'll see. Christmas Eve. Each Christmas Eve it takes a child. And if you open, you'll see it. I promise you'll see it. Three more loud knocks echoed out. And for the first time in my life, I saw fear flicker across my dad's face. As I could hear my mom stirring from her room. Shouting through, asking what was going on. Three knocks once more this time more pronounced. Please, Dad, look at the door, open it, and you'll believe me. It's here for me. My dad's hand trembled as it held the calendar tightly. Slowly, he opened the last door to see what was shown. God, no! He yelled out, and with that we heard the most hideous of sounds, one which was laced with dread a click of a lock, the turning of a handle, and the front door opening to the cold. Then, footsteps climbing stairs, looking, seeking, and then slowly coming down the hall towards my room. Dad, please, please help me. I pleaded as the nightmarish thing in our house drew closer. He looked at me, trying his best to hide his fear but I could see it etched into his face, into his soul. Listen to me, son. As soon as I go out there, I need you to grab all your things, anything heavy, and barricade your door. 
Don't let anyone in this room unless it's me or your mother. I believe in that moment he saw the utter despair in my eyes, and before he left the room as the footsteps reached the room next to mine, he spoke gently, patted me on the head. It'll be okay, he said. Then he was gone. I did as he said, and as soon as he left the room I moved my nightstand, my chair, my books, anything I could against the door, sobbing as I did, sobbing my eyes out, praying that my parents were safe. At first I heard nothing throughout the house, then suddenly violent shouting erupted, a struggle quickly followed with what sounded like furniture being thrown and glass smashed. And then the worst of it, my mother screaming. She cried and yelled and agonized. And finally, I could not bear it anymore. I could not leave her alone. Clearing the things away from my door, I opened it and wandered down the darkened hall. A cold, icy air blew through the house. The front door lay open. Decorations swung in the frozen breeze. And outside knelt my mother, alone terrified, screaming into the night. Losing a parent is hard for a child, and to do so on Christmas Eve harder still. Yet the torture of that night cuts deeper than most. Few can know my true pain. Over the years I have tried to understand it more clearly, understand what my life was before and what it is now, to little avail. I cannot give solid explanations, nor can I say that my anger will ever truly diminish. I have tried to live as best as I can, putting the mystery out of my mind each year. Each year, that is, until Christmas, when the memories flood back like a comforting blanket, seen torn away by a silent hand from the dark. My own children, now grown up, have asked me why I become a little distant at this time of year, and to that I have given no real answer. All I can say is this, I do know two things. The first is that no one ever saw or heard from my dad again. My mother remained tight-lipped until she died about what had come into our house that night, what took her husband, and who can blame her. I also know what that last door of the advent calendar contained, and what had frightened my dad so badly. It was a drawing like the others, a happy Christmas scene, one with one horrid addition. It showed a boy sleeping soundly in his bed on Christmas Eve, a child who looked uncannily like my poor friend Finn unaware that his life would soon be over and that he was being watched through the frosted window by his killer whose face looked remarkably like that of my father's.